the enthusiasm and affection of distinguished delegates like you is the reason of the origin of this program this program is the culmination of the endeavor to integrate evidence based medicine with the clinical practice in the area of gastroenterology there has been tremendous progress in this field of gi endoscopy over the past few years and eSpace aims to incorporate this dynamic progress to the best of its capacity every year with most learning points illustrated from the point of view of a day to day practice eSpace promises to be a highly interactive and practice oriented event I once again welcome all of you to this made to order unique program devoted to learning and sharing. Sun Pharma has always valued the strong commitment for disseminating the latest scientific information and sharing every form of knowledge available to us. Reaching people and touching lives based on innovation has been the direction of our journey since the inception. I'm sure that this program will meet your rich academic expectations. and your participation in this event will be very fruitful i thank you once again and a warm welcome to all of you over to professor tantai professor tantai you can unmute unmute hey good morning everybody Today we are having a great webinar program uh, with collaboration with Asia Institute of Gastroenterology Hyderabad India uh, the place where the world class endoscopists trained and we have three speakers eminent speakers and the first speakers I will this is my great pleasure to introduce the first speaker professor uh, Nageshwar Reddy uh, who does not need no intro, uh, does not need intro, introduction and he is war you know gastroenterologist and chairman of Asia Institute of Gastroenterology Hyderabad past president of war endoscopy organization and dr nagesh already is one of our respectable um, teacher and who always support our nimajia and liver society he is also a honorary professor of university of medicine too and as you all know or because of the covid-19 infection all the endoscopy service have to reduce half of the pre covid era now we have to live with new normal life so we have to start endoscopy unit with safely and the uh, safe for the patient as well as the endoscopy staffs so that uh, professor nagesh already will deliver the lecture on how to how safely uh, we have to start endoscopy service dr dianeri sir please thank you dr tantana it's a great pleasure to be associated with uh, myanmar doctors uh, first regarding the speed space what happened was that uh, we used to for the last few years at the aig conduct this very short term courses uh, two or three days for young aspiring endoscopists who would come for this time we have very practical talks followed by live demonstrations and a hands on animal workshop this was the pattern it was getting very popular and lot of people asked us uh, to continue this for long however with covid coming in it was not possible to do it that way because of the travel restrictions and so on so then we converted to e space e space is similar that we give this short very practical lectures and then have the live demonstrations only thing is we don't have the animal hands on which of course is not possible with this uh, technique uh, this is now been uh, e space is now again getting very popular and uh, like to thank sun pharma for actually being a partner with this uh, mr mahesh uh, in myanmar from sun pharma has been very enthusiastic has coordinated all this and i like to thank him for this of course our association with the myanmar doctors are extremely uh, warm for many years i think professor tantana was one of the first uh, doctors to come to our unit and since then we've had many uh, they are more like our brothers and sisters so it's a big pleasure for me to interact with them and be part of the unit and i think all our unit knows every doctor there and uh, we are very thankful to sun for connecting us together again so and for this uh, particular e space program we have uh, three talks Uh, we won't have uh, individual questions after the talks because it takes up more time we finish all the talks 
we have uh, three or four interesting cases to show live demonstration and then we can have a question answer session after that that would be the format okay so we'll start now with the first talk which uh, uh, i would be giving on uh, what is going to happen with covid now coming to an end um, in fact in a previous discussion with uh, professor tanta and i i was told that uh, the incidence of covid is not so much in myanmar in fact it's uh, much less than what we see in other countries um, i think um, vietnam myanmar and some of the other countries have been um, not only lucky but i think they have done very well in terms of restricting their covid but still there is going to be some infection in the community and uh, now that uh, we see at least in asian countries a downward spiral of this infection we have to start thinking of how we start back our normal services in fact endoscopy services are the ones which are most affected uh, by this uh, uh, infection pandemic and uh, now i think we should come back to normal slowly uh, what we will what i will do is to give you a talk on um on this uh, but of course everybody knows about um, the corona virus how it uh, actually <clears throat> lands up at the ace receptor and then is integrated into the cell the most important uh, s or spike protein which is responsible a lot of vaccinations against spike protein the vaccine development has been very vigorous uh, even in our country our net, uh, indigenous vaccine is in phase 3 and hopefully by early next year we'll start uh, routine vaccination of all the individuals and till then of course we have to be careful now how is the gastroenterology is interested in this uh, before we go to endoscopy i think uh, what we did realize over this period when we were studying covid patients was that uh, about 15% of uh, these patients actually come with gi symptoms could be diarrhea nausea vomiting and abdominal pain about 20% have liver injury and uh, some of the patients we have now experience of treating about 2000 patients in our institute we found that 10% can come only with gi symptoms nothing else no cough nothing they come with diarrhea or nausea and when you actually test them for rt pcr for covid it's positive so i think this is important to keep that uh, in practice for gastroenterologists you can sometimes get these patients directly just with the symptoms uh, majority of these are in form of uh, nausea and vomiting but we've seen a significant percentage coming with uh, diarrhea or developing diarrhea during their course of illness in small percentage of abdominal pain we have seen severe cases of abdominal pain uh, when there is a superior mesenteric artery arteritis or blockage that can occur in this patient so one has to be aware of this also now what are the implications of gastrointestinal problems this is a very busy slide but a early very early article that came from china we showed that uh, patients with gastrointestinal symptoms uh, do worse all these yellow bars are patients with gastrointestinal symptoms and this is blue is no gastrointestinal symptom so you can see in all categories in case of complications or in epidemiological characteristic patients who had associated gastrointestinal symptoms do worse they have higher morbidity higher death rates and so on and this is important to remember so when we see a patient with covid with gi symptoms be more careful uh, be more uh, intensive in treating and monitoring these patients so early on when this came uh, society of gi endoscopy um, and of course indian society of gastroenterology came together to give this joint guidelines what to do during covid and since then several societies including the apw which uh, is probably the best guidelines that we have has come up with guidelines the world endoscopy organization has come with guidelines and of course asg and eag so all of them have come up with certain guidelines Uh, of course uh, still as we are in the pandemic some of these guidelines have to be followed but as we as we come to the end of the pandemic we have to switch now the reason why endoscopy became very important uh, is that initially it was thought that covid transmission is a droplet infection that is these large droplets which are usually more than 5 microns are dropped onto the surface you touch the surface and then it comes through your nose mouth or eyes uh, to the next person this was what that's why hand washing and all of them was it but uh, we now realize that uh, droplet infection is part but not the most important part the most important part is aerosol infection and this aerosol infection or so called airborne infection occurs with particles which are less than 5 micrometers in fact uh, it now realize that most of the covid transmission is occurring through aerosol and we know that endoscopy is aerosol infection related so therefore the chance of transmitting uh, 
uh, in endoscopy is extremely high, especially in patients who get intubated and so on. In fact, estimations have shown that somebody who is talking loud for one minute can transmit about 750,000 um, particles of virus. So you see, if you are in contact with person at least six feet or less, then the chance of getting it very high. Again, this very interesting article in New England Journal early on showed that this aerosol infection, uh, when it occurs, the particles stay in the room for about three hours. So if you have a COVID patients in whom you have done endoscopy, uh, for, if the particles can stay for a long period of time. And that's why everybody around all the staff has to take precautions in terms of uh, uh, how they protect themselves. Also, it has been shown that uh, any particle on a surface which is very smooth like stainless steel and so on. So in the endoscopy rooms, all our monitors and um, furniture is more stainless steel or very uh, plastic type of furniture. Here, the virus has been shown to stay at least for eight hours. And therefore, that's the reason why in between the cases, the endoscopy rooms, half an hour is given and cleaning is done. Both the floor and all the monitors and so on are clean. Also emphasis that you must have as less furniture as possible in the endoscopy rooms. And uh, the number of people assisting in a case, the total number of people involved in a case should not be more than three. So these are all the uh, precautions that we're taking, trying to prevent transmission to people in endoscopy. So what is the risk of this transmission, especially to healthcare workers? How to overcome risk and what are the precautions to be taken? both before, during, after endoscopy. And let me give you some practical tips. Now, the risk of endoscopy we know is high because it's aerosol generating. Uh, it's also positive insufflation and especially uh, endoscopy, we inflate so much of carbon dioxide. So all of this is a positive insufflation, increasing the viral transmission. And of course, uh, in addition, in addition to endoscopy and the technique itself spreading, we can, the virus can spread from the patient to uh, the, all the personnel around by a direct contact technique. Now, we actually looked at the estimations here. One would be very frightened that uh, because of this, the incident should be very high. I'll come to the statistics a little later. But what is also important for the endoscopy is that 50% of SARS-CoV is detected. In, that is, if you take all the patients, in 50%, you will have this infection in the feces. And this can persist much longer than in a patient in the in the respiratory tract. For example, you have had patients who recovered completely uh, from the COVID and after six weeks, if you look at the stool, they still have this uh, virus. So there is a potential that during colonoscopy or colonoscopy contamination, this can spread. And of course, uh, this is the reason why precautions are taken both uh, during and after the procedure. As I said, there are a lot of uh, different uh, um, guidelines that have been given. The most important guideline I would suggest is the APSD guideline which we made in the early part of this COVID. Most of our knowledge of COVID initially came from Ali Alexander Ripici's unit um, and I think uh, uh, Professor Tanta and I was there for the lecture with Alexandro gave initially very short, very clearly what are the risk factors involved and so on. So in, in general when we talk about uh, COVID-19 endoscopy, you're talking about two types of cases, urgent cases, emergency cases. Now, if you look at the bottom line, you'll see that the risks for physician is 5%, for nurses 4%, for healthcare workers is 8% in doing this COVID uh, problem. So I would, what I would suggest that each of you in your own unit, you must test for COVID for your healthcare workers, both by RT-PCR and for antibodies baseline. So we did this very interesting data we have from our unit. We found, this is going to be published soon, uh, Mohan and his colleagues did a very extensive study. We have found that if you take the incidence uh, of both the virus and antibodies in the endoscopy unit, it's about uh, 5%. That is exposure to the virus is about 5%. But when we looked at our hospital employees, we have about 200 employees in endoscopy unit and only 10 of them have either got or got exposed to this virus. We have 4,000 employees in the hospital. And we found that 15% of the employees had the virus or exposed to the virus. That is, the incidence of uh, this infection in healthcare workers outside endoscopy room is three times more. So it's less in endoscopy. This is very paradoxical. You may ask why this has happened. The reason is that I think in endoscopy we are more protected. We are taking more protection. We are taking certain precautions compared to healthcare workers in the hospital other than in endoscopy areas where they can sometimes be quite negligent. Again, in the COVID areas, the incidence is very less because of the precautions they are taking.
we used to postpone routine endoscopies in the very high phase of this infection now we are not doing it now we can do routine endoscopy the precautions at endoscopy is the distance of course because endoscopy is less than 6 feet near the patient the transmission is very high at 6 feet uh, and of course uh, we know that from earlier studies a very good study from johnston was published in ji endoscopy we looked at face masks so when they took the face masks and studied uh, the face masks uh, what is the infection on in the face mask they could see that uh, unknowingly the face mask after an endoscopic procedure is full of infectious material so this is important to remember uh, during the 2003 sars outbreak some of us remember this still uh, we realized that how far this infected material can go 6 feet in fact now there studies showing that even 9 feet may be the so the distance in which this have to go so other important thing is that about 80% of uh, uh, asymptomatic carriers can be coming for and that is if you look at all the patients coming with uh, for endoscopy with covid 20% are only those who are actually having fevers and so on so you take precautions 80% of them may not have anything and this asymptomatic carriers are the most uh, problematic ones so we actually looked at estimates of asymptomatic carriers coming to a hospital again 10% of our opd patients 10% of our people coming with asymptomatic for something as for ibs and so on were actually carrying this virus so this is a significant percentage so the reason is important is to show you what to do in future about these people so what i would suggest is every patient coming to endoscopy is taken as a potential carrier now this is a very important uh, uh, guys like guidelines that has been given by several societies what we do now is to um actually categorize a patient to low intermediate and high risk low risk are those normal people who come uh, they have no symptoms they have no contact with the positive patient and they are not staying in high risk area so these three are taken into importance whereas high risk are those who have one of the symptoms and uh, can have contact with the positive person so depending on low intermediate or high risk we can categorize how we actually look after this patient this is a little more complicated but i think it's become very important now this is the apdw uh, guidelines that we have issued uh, what to do with this patient uh, it all depends upon uh, what uh, uh, not only on symptoms uh, uh, your um, uh, association with travel contact but also occupation and cluster and also this takes into account that if this patients have con- have ability to do covid test i'm not sure whether you can do rapid covid test in uh, in um, myanmar but we have started doing it very extensively now the rapid covid test point of contact test costs about uh, uh, for us it's costing around 4 to 5 dollars and uh, we can uh, do this uh, as outpatient before the patient comes for endoscopy the specificity is very high but sensitivity is low but still it's very high specificity so therefore we use it in our patients and this is a suggestion that was also given by apw that uh, in all patients to do point of contact test i'll try and simplify this chart a little later but we now know that we have two categories of patients emergency patients whether they low intermediate high risk you have to do whereas in elective we are now trying to take mainly emergency and urgent patients of course i, I don't think you recognize mohan in this but he's actually mohan wearing all this uh, face shield and masks and this has become routine in endoscopy now some of us don't wear the face shield because of if you are wearing uh, specs and a mask that's good enough but most people prefer to wear the face uh, face shield and also the gown that is there you can see uh, so now how do you categorize so if you have high risk patients we suggest that you wear the full pp full pp includes uh, a gown double gloves hair net uh, n95 mask whereas if you have low risk patient then we just wear only single gloves you can wear a hair net goggles and a surgical mask intermediate you can do depending upon what category for colonoscopy we don't suggest such vigorous um, you know, protection because it's relatively safe chances are less from colonoscopy so only for endoscopy and for interventional procedures er cp us we would suggest all this we also on the patient we are using this type of mask with the covering to protect ourselves but more importantly we started using you will see this even in the live workshop we do this this is a very interesting way to protect yourself and i suggest this strongly to all of you in myanmar doing endoscopy just take a plastic sheet and make a small tunnel in the plastic sheet you can just put a plaster here it becomes a short tunnel 
and then you can pass your endoscope with that. This has been shown to be very protective. So even if the patient is COVID positive, using this uh, technique of uh, uh, a plastic sheet is very cheap, few cents, and it's very helpful in protecting. And then this is of course disposable. Uh, in cases which are COVID positive, where you have to do a prolonged procedure, and this again a poem being done in a patient who is COVID positive, you see we use a specialized plastic container with two openings, which for both the anesthetist and for endoscopies. So this is uh, uh, only if COVID positive patient. But all the other patients, I would suggest that in all your cases, upper GI, colonos, I mean uh, ERCP, US, kindly use this type of plastic sheet, which is very simple and very protective. Now, in the pre-procedure and post-procedure area, we suggest that all the staff there wear routine surgical masks. There's no need of wearing N95 mask. The routine surgical mask is enough along with nitrile gloves to protect. So, staff should be wearing that in this area. Uh, should we delay elective procedures? I won't recommend strongly now because COVID is coming down. But I would uh, suggest that certain procedures, for example, screening colonoscopy, follow-up for esophageal varices, or those patients with um, definite irritable bowel, you just want to do a check colonoscopy. These can be uh, actually um, postponed, uh, especially colonoscopy screening, I think should not be done. Uh, interval endoscopies to see if varices are ed eradicated or ulcer as healed should not be done. And of course, motility study we try and postpone as much as possible. But rest of the endoscopy like GI bleed, perforation, those with dysphagia, those with cholangitis, and of course, uh, those with pancreatic disease like fluid collection, all this you should not postpone. They should be uh, treated endoscopically. There is no, no problem in treating once you take precautions. There are of course other indications like GA obstruction. Uh, also, evaluating a cancer patient, the staging should be done. Uh, or change of management in IBD. All these cases, I think you can do endoscopy safely now. There is no problem. So, in general, uh, we sort of categorize our patients into these three categories, elective, semi-urgent and urgent. Elective, when there is no immediate benefit of endoscopy, endoscopy can be deferred, especially in functional bowel disease patient. And if you want to do surveillance endoscopy, this you can sort of put off till probably another two months when we are going to get the vaccine. Uh, so, in semi-urgent, of course, we evaluate clinically. We try and do those cases where it's necessary. For example, sometimes uh, ESD for early neoplasm or ERCP, uh, in a pre-operative drainage or pre neoadjuvant therapy, we can do. And urgent, of course, in all the urgent patients, we have to do ERCP, uh, I mean endoscopy, whenever it's necessary. So this is a very easy category. This is how we should go about now. Now, in this APDW, APSD statement, we also made certain 11 statements. I recommend you to look at this in the gut. Uh, I won't go through each of them, but only uh, the important one, the 11th one is that uh, as we are getting out of this COVID, in each of the staff, uh, the, the chief of the staff there should make uh, uh, actually a decision regarding resource allocation of staff, medical equipment and so on. So what happened is when there was a peak of this COVID, we actually, most of the units divided themselves into three batches when there is sufficient number of people. So the batches would come in alternate days or once in three days. The other batch would be out to protect themselves. So if suppose somebody got infected, you still had a reserve. In a large unit like ours, it was not a problem because if somebody got infected, there were others to look after. Uh, so it depends upon the type of unit you are working on. The other thing is you must see the sufficient uh, PPEs, sufficient scopes to tackle this. For example, uh, now that you have to wait half an hour before the next endoscope, you have to see that you have sufficient scopes. So all these uh, particular requirements will depend upon your local need and what has to be done. And therefore, each chief has to look at this and make it. Uh, regular monitoring of PPEs is very important and this is what happened early on in Italy and even in New York. Uh, they didn't monitor this properly, sometimes they are doing procedures without PPE and that's why unfortunately almost 170 doctors died in Italy. But once we started using this, for example, uh, there has been a zero mortality in our own institute or many places now because of adequate use of this PPEs. And also the second important thing is stepwise resumption of now that COVID is going off, you must start off your endoscopy, but do it stepwise. First do for certain semi-urgent indications and then go on to the regular routine indications. It will also be depend upon availability of manpower and equipment supply. So these three gui practice guidelines I'd like to emphasize as we are starting to reopen our endoscopy unit. So just to simplify the previous chart I showed you of APSD, it's very simple. 
what we do in our institute now no fever no no cough elective or emergency procedure can go on if the patient has fever but the fever is gi cause for example cholangitis and so on and then uh, we still go on but patient has fever and cough but still has a strong indication for endoscopy we now do in urgent cases the spot test the spot test is easily available i'm sure i'm not sure whether it's still available in myanmar but if, if it's not available you should get it it is very cheap costs uh, 5 to 6 uh, dollars that's all the result you can get uh, within half an hour so if patient is waiting for endoscopy you can do it and you get the results within half an hour it is done in same the swab is taken the same way but uh, you get a immediate result uh, the sensitivity uh, is uh, is very specific 100% specific but picks up about 60% of the case only but still this is something we are using very very much in our units now in non urgent case if you have an ercp for example or a endosonography or or a poem case then we are now doing rt pcr in all these cases and because these cases require intubation long this thing so we do an rt pcr and those who are negative go for this and those who are positive uh, will have to stay back for 15 days and negative only taken about uh, approximately around uh, 15% of our cases are being postponed because of uh, somebody who is coming with no symptoms we want to do poem but when you do rt pcr it's positive so 15% of the patients are getting postponed but still is worthwhile postponing these cases otherwise infection to the staff is very 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 high now regarding endoscopy processing it has been shown that the standard processing is sufficient to kill the virus in fact all you have to do is even if you don't do all the standard with just external part of the endoscope is clean with an alcohol swab then the internal parts we flush with alcohol if you do these two precautions you will kill the virus in almost all the cases so endoscopic transmission of uh, covid has not been demonstrated anywhere in the world so this is i think fairly safe because the virus is very sensitive to even small amount of alcohol uh, we actually published a study recently in gastroenterology saying what is the impact of covid uh, pandemic on endoscopy units all over the world and these are 252 centers from 55 countries which was done on the be- on behalf of world endoscopy organization and uh, because we are sort of getting worried as our endoscopy numbers are coming down is it uh, okay and all and you can see from this uh, the volumes of endoscopy has come down in all the countries you can see that if you look at uh, all the volumes it's come down very much remarkably uh, you can see especially if you're looking at the uh, ERCP procedures come down much more only in, in japan and the parts like in vietnam and so on they are still maintaining very high volume still but in other countries the volumes have come down and uh, we also looked at uh, what are the precautions they are taking you can see that uh, almost all the units uh, are using the special type of mask especially n95 masks in uh, in endoscopy units there's been a controversy whether we should use n95 in endoscopy or even a simple surgical mask is okay ali that Alexander Repici showed that even surgical masks are okay, but as a precaution, most of the units are now using N95 masks in these patients. Of course, other thing that has happened is what we are doing now. I think telemedicine, teleteaching, online uh, learning has become very important. And uh, again, I suggest this to all my friends in Myanmar: continue with this activity is very important because another three four months we can't just wait. I think travel will be only from ne- second half of next year. so we have to keep in touch with each other we have to transmit our ideas we have to teach each other so therefore i think we should continue with this uh, online courses that are going on and this is my favorite final slide i show that before corona what happened this is to be our unit and after corona this is look what happened this is the unit there are very few people and uh, also this is what you should follow in terms of endoscopy scheduling when you call your patients for endoscopy ask them to come uh, at a staggered way so that people can come morning afternoon evening they are not coming together and sitting at the same place so the new normal i think is going to change now now we are in this area only after the vaccine comes and this is going to be i don't know how many months but we are hopeful that the beginning of january the first vaccines will come in uh, most of us will have access to this vaccine including in myanmar by middle of next year so hopefully we'll have this and then we can come back to a new, new normal until that new normal comes i think it's very important that uh, we follow all these precautions again like to thank all the doctors in myanmar and also uh, professor tandanai and sun pharma for giving me this opportunity thank you very much thank you thank you dr jnwari sir your excellent and clear um, 
or description about how to start an endoscopy unit. So I will introduce the second speaker, uh, who is no other than Dr. Rakesh Kalapala. Uh, Kala, Kala. Uh, he's a senior consultant gastroenterologist, interventional, interventional endosonography as well. It is, he's from Asia Institute of Gastroenterology. As I mentioned before, EIG trained world-class uh, gastroenterologist. So Dr. Rakesh is also one of them. He is also a director of Center of Obesity and Metabolic uh, Therapy and in charge of gastrointestinal mortality lab. He's really all-rounded uh, gastroenterologist. He also received many uh, international awards and many publications. And metabolic, as you know, metabolic endoscopy is new era. Let's see. And incidence of obesity is increasing all over the world as well. So Dr. Rakesh Kalapala will deliver a, a lecture on advance in bariatric in metabolic endoscopy. Dr. Rakesh, please. Thank you, Professor Tantan and Sanfama for giving me the opportunity. So first, before going into the advances in bariatric and metabolic endoscopy, so what I want to tell you now is as the pandemic COVID is going on, obesity also is a pandemic situation. And if you ask me, everybody should will agree with me that around 70 to 80 percent of the mortality happening in this COVID-19 positive patients is because of obesity. So there's a chronic low-grade inflammation in any obese person, which we don't know where the pro-inflammatory cytokines dominate the anti-inflammatory cytokines. And when upon this if some viral infection attacks, then they'll have severe mortality and morbidity. So the current surgical, bariatric surgical strategies, I don't think they will never meet the demand of uh, the tackling the obesity. So if you see, I'm sure Myanmar also will be competing with India. India is competing with other Western countries. As you see, the latest census around 19% males and 26% female prevalence of obesity in India. So, Coming straight in the topic, endoscopy is a logical progression in this field of bariatric endoscopy. So you see in orthopedics and cardiology how the arthroscopy and angioplasty have taken the main seat. So I personally feel that endos bariatric endoscopy is going to be a bridge or kind of replacement to few of the bariatric surgeries in the near future. So if you see the bariatric endoscopy, I'll deal with these four part, three parts primarily. So you have the gastric space occupying devices, then you have the endoscopic suture gastroplasties, which are primarily on the stomach. And third is the endoscopic bypass, that is the duodenal jejunal bypass liners, very interesting area. And of course, bariatric endoscopy has a different role in post-surgical complications, which itself is a topic which I don't uh, touch upon because of time constraints. So if you see the bariatric uh, and metabolic endoscopy in short or in a nutshell, so you have the gastric devices and you have the small bowel devices. So the primary difference between this is in gastric devices, uh, devices you have the weight loss with metabolic effects dependent on the weight loss. Whereas vis-a-vis -vis in the small bowel uh, devices, you have the metabolic uh, effects independent of weight loss, but definitely there will be some amount of weight loss. So these two are completely different scenarios. And the end of the uh, I, the talk, I will say how important is it to club these two devices, uh, two areas. So if you see interventions in the stomach, you have the balloons, you have the transparent shuttle, you have the endoscopic sleeve gastroplasties, and you have the gastric aspiration. So balloons, again, uh, very interesting. I, I don't want to go into the routine balloons because you all also have good experience on the routine trans intragastric balloons. So either they are air-filled or liquid-filled primarily, two categories. And uh, most of them have a longevity of around 6 to 12 months. And the total body weight was observed in literature so far is 6 to 12 percent. And if you see here, there are different companies being producing this. The Orbera is the Apollo endosurgery uh, balloon. Then you have the reshaped balloon and the Obelon balloon. This is a very interesting uh, area, like where the endos, there is minimi minimizing the endos. Probably in this COVID and the post COVID era, these things are going to take a big uh, front seat. So here you see an animation video. The capsule is just ingested like how we take the video capsule and then once it goes inside the stomach it will swell 
and usually within eight weeks we will put two to three capsules, and after six months, uh, six months the endoscopically these capsules are removed. So now you can ask me why you do have to do even that endoscopy also. That's true. So for that now this is a new balloon called ellipse which you are going to get soon in Indian market also. So this is just a capsule which you ingest like the earlier oblong balloon, and the capsule goes inside. Then you pull the tag, and you see on the animation once it goes inside the stomach. It will swell up on and then create a space occupying device kind of thing in the stomach. And once it swells up and reaches the normal position, then obviously you will have the restriction to eat. And then in six months to nine months or 12 months, the, actually now it has got only a six months longevity. So once uh, the desired weight loss is achieved, you don't have to go and then take it out by endoscopy. As you see here, it gets disintegrated inside the stomach and then it passes off in the intestine and the fecal matter. So you can see how much of uh, advancement is happening and probably you sit in your office, patient comes, you give the capsule, he takes and then walks off and after six months he'll be coming back with you with weight loss. So that's a beauty of it. The another balloon which we are currently using a lot is a sparks balloon. The advantage of this is an adjustable balloon which you can put it and then if the patient feels intolerable which we see in most of the gastric balloons, you can kind of uh, take off 50 to 100 ml and then reduce the size. And after four to six months, if the patient doesn't have the desired weight loss, you can increase the volume also. So this is a very uh, user-friendly balloon. And I, there's one study which has shown that the adjustable balloon is having a different score compared to the non-adjustable balloon because you can anytime uh, monitor, uh, uh, you can adjust the balloon according to the convenience of the patient. So based on this, we just started a study in AAG about the patients uh, with NASH or NAFED putting in this adjustable gastric balloon and then trying to find out what is the advantage of this compared to a non-adjustable gastric balloon. So these are the things which are going on. So second part of the talk is the endoscopic gastric remodeling. So you have uh, the endoscopic gastric, uh, endoscopic gastroplasties, which is Apollo overstitch with many of you also familiar in Myanmar. Then you have the primary obesity surgical endoluminal that is a pose, which is again a US based company who is uh, due for FDA approval. And you have the endomena, which is from Jack Davies unit, designed by Vincent Huberti. So it's a Belgian product, which we also have a good hands-on experience. So I just I won't go into the depth of it, but ESG, as you see from the Apollo Overstitch device, there is a two-year data and the recent uh, publication by Beam Sharayagu from New York, five-year follow-up, which is the largest follow-up till now in the literature, showed a 15% weight loss one year, 15 at three years and 14.5 years. So this is something phenomenal, which nobody can even uh, dream of, even in, in patients, it's at par with the bariatric surgeries. So as you see here, the endomena is the one which uh, we, as I told, have a, uh, experience, little experience on this. And this is the data by uh, Jack Davis Union published in uh, 2017, where they found excessive weight loss of the body and total body weight loss of around 8% in one year. They have in fact now of course two to three year follow up also. So I'll just show you a short video of how it is done. It's just like sleeve gastroplasty by Apollo overstitch. But the only thing is you do the islands of uh, uh, gastroplasty unlike a continuous suturing pattern what you see in this. It's a very simple technique and uh, hardly it takes around 30 to 40 minutes to suture the whole stomach. So based on this, what we started now is we started a multi-center study with 15 centers in Europe and one center in Asia that is ours. The safety of this device in patients with NAFL and NASH, where we are going to do a paid liver biopsies pre and post endomina and then trying to see how much of benefit the patients have who have obesity and NAFL. Another one very interesting is the endozip. It's not there in the market, it's probably going to come soon. It is Israeli uh, based company who has done this. So it's it's actually it's so nice that it's a fully automated device and it's operator independent kind of. We just put it there and the uh, device itself will start switching your stomach and they will be allowed, allowing the durable restrictive switches. So I think probably it is even made more easy once this comes into in regular practice. So. Uh, Continuing with the gastric devices, this is again a very interesting uh, uh, thing which I wanted to share with you. So if you see the physiology of anatomy and physiology of the gastric cardia, there are multiple mechanoreceptors at the G junction in the cardia level. 
So if you put some localized force on that, that will probably lead to early satiety and weight loss. With this in the back of the mind, there is a company, from, uh, there's a guru from Michigan. In fact, he's a bariatric surgeon himself, has started doing this bariatric stent he designed. And this is a modified esophageal stent concept, what we regularly see in the self-expanded metallic stents. So here, what they did is they took a uh, disc, which is at the gastric area and the esophageal normal stent like thing. And there's a delivery system, which will be easily deployed. And it hardly takes uh, 10 minutes for this to deploy. And then you anchor it at the proximal level with the Apollo stitch. So I'll just show you a short video. And uh, this is actually, we started in our unit and we have done the first in human trials in the world where you uh, put in the device, as you see on the screen, endoscopic screen, it will create a disc kind of thing in the G junction. And then you will have esophageal strength, which will be projected up to the esophagus. And at the proximal end of the esophagus, you stitch it by anchoring it, giving we're doing with three Apollo overstitch switches. So this is how it is done. Then we retain the device for six months. And because of the compression or the pressure on the gastric cardia, the mechanoreceptors will uh, uh, exert pressure leading to early satiety and weight loss. So this is the way how it is uh, removed. And as you see, on, after six months, you hardly have any uh, congestion or any mucosal edema. And it's pretty much easy where we hardly take five to 10 minutes to between the device. So um, based on this, the company has gone for FDA approval with the interim clinical data. And then we are trying to do even more studies on the patients in the coming near future. Because of COVID, obviously, we had a stand soon, but we'll be coming back. So that is what uh, is on the gastric devices. Now, the small intestine devices. I'm sure uh, with the ethnicity of the population in Myanmar, India is more or less same. So we have diabetes, obesity, and NAFED. If you can treat all these in one nutshell, that is going to be a paradigm shift in the field of uh, bariatric endoscopy. So on this basis of the physiology or uh, pathology, so the interventions for small bowel started. And of course, uh, there is one FDA approved device which was withdrawn again, probably to go to the FDA approved. But as of now, there are no FDA approved devices, but there are CMARC devices. So what happens is duodenum is now the metabolic center for control of uh, uh, metabolic control. So as you see on the screen here, if you put a device that is a duodenal jejun bypass liner, what happens is it will prevent the uh, nutrients getting absorbed in the intestine because there is a polyteflon sheath which stops it. And then they'll be increasing the GLP-1 analog secretion and increasing the POIY peptides, which leads to uh, good control of the glycemic index. So there is one, as I told you, the FDA approved device called the endo barrier, which was, uh, which has got a significant improvement in the literature being published, but because of uh, some adverse events, it was withdrawn. Basically more, more of the liver abscess, the reason why FDA has withdrawn from the market. So based on this concept, what we at AAG started working on a new device called endo sleeve, which as you see on the screen, it is a having a biflange stent which acts as a pylorodiodenal area as an anchor and there is a sheath of 60 centimeters which will cover the duodenal part up to D2 with, thereby preventing the absorption of nutrients and increasing the GLP and log secretions. So this is endoscopic video on the left side of the screen, the animation where there is a capsule at the pylorodiodenal junction which will open up once you deploy like a biflange stent what we use in the uh, US uh, drainage uh, pancreatic fluid collection drainages and there is a sheath which will cover the duodenal area up to D2. So this is the animation video and I will just show you how it looks uh, on a live uh, human uh, case. So this is how it looks where you put in the capsule and uh, on the floor you can see there is an opening of the pyloric end and there is opening of the duodenal end. So this biflange acts as an anchor and this sheath what you see on here is a polyteflon PTFE made, which will prevent the absorption of nutrients. So this is how it is deployed. It hardly takes 20 to 25 minutes. And this is the animation video with a live video of how to retrieve it. So there's a lasso, like any other esophageal stent or any other metallic self-expandable removable stent. You push, you pull the lasso, and then the whole stent collapses and then gets into the capsule. And you can easily retrieve it outside. So on this, uh, basis we have done the first in human trials again in the, in, in the world 
and we have had around 10 patients whom the data will share. As you see here, there was around 1.8% HPA1C improvement in three months with around 12 to 13% weight loss. So, uh, the another area which is uh, again most of you know and there are umpteen number of uh, articles being published that is a duodenal mucosal resurfacing procedure which is a heat technology where uh, you elevate the duodenal mucosa uh, with saline and then you burn the mucosa with hot water thereby it will kind of kill the anthropomorphic cells uh, which are responsible for the uh, diabetes. So this is uh, very easily done and mind you this is more reproducible you can do it again every six months to 12 months and uh, see there is a CE mark approval and they are soon going to get a FDA approval uh, with this what happens as you see here that you ablate the mucosa then after three to six months the mucosa as you see in the last part is completely normal so then you can probably redo it in every six to 12 months so they have multiple studies published in last one year follow-up in fact only two year follow-up where they have found with this DMR technique there is improvement in HbA1c level and of course you should have a residual pancreatic beta cell function. It's not that uh, probably type 1 diabetic people may not, may not uh, have a benefit with this. Then they also showed improvement uh, after DMR in the uh, NAFL and NASH population as well as decrease in the microalbuminuria in patients who have the early chronic kidney disease. So that is about the duodenal area and now we have uh, endoscopic jejunal ileal bypass and duodenal ileal bypass. This is again a very interesting thing. This company called GI Dynamics from US, which has started doing this, where there are octagonal magnets which you deploy it. Uh, you need two scopes for this one is from the oral and one from the oral end. And then these two will come at the jejunal ileal area. And as you see this animation, so both these uh, magnets are deployed, deployed on the either side of the pole. And after six to seven days, there will be a rent created naturally through which there will be a jejunal ileal bypass, which probably is one of the uh, promising procedures to address the diabetes. So if you see the duodeno jejunal bypass liners, so the advantage of this is, as I told you from the last couple of slides, glycemic control, weight loss, and there's improvement in the cardiometabolic component by decreasing the lipid levels and also improvement in the blood pressure levels. So as I told you in the beginning of my talk, endobariatrics, I think the future lies here in the next decade there is going to be a dual approach where you have the stomach and small bowel, the stomach to address the weight loss and small bowel to address the diabetes. So the diabetes, that is diabetes and obesity population. So if you can combine these two procedures and then address both your gastric part and the duodenal part, so that's going to be a big boom in this field for the people who really benefit with, especially in people with BMI of 30 to 40. So as we all know, we are evolving day by day and the necessity is the mother of invention. So we have to do something to uh, address our people and then give the best treatment practice for them. But to conclude before, as Dr. Reddy always says, it's always a multidisciplinary approach which you need to treat this bariatric population. It's not like a single individual doing it and then trying to you know, do everything on home. So you need a, a team of uh, people, like-minded and then committed people to do this. So with this in the back of the mind, we at AAG started a center for obesity and metabolic therapy with a group of, it's like a one-stop shop for any obese patient who will come and then unbiasedly they will be seen by an endoscopist, physician, surgeon, endocrinologist, nutritionist, clinical psychologist, physiotherapist. And then as you see the pyramid here, obviously lifestyle, diet and physical activity is the first uh, line of treatment. Surgery of course established the middle of the pyramid, the endoscopic bariatric therapy. So we feel that it is going to be the uh, addressing many of the people with this uh, obesity and diabetes uh, ailments. And this is going to be taking a big leap in the next uh, decade or so. So just to conclude, who qualifies for weight loss uh, surgery or other endoscopic procedures? Overweight, definitely we have the diet and lifestyle modification. Obese, you have the endoscopy, which is very well established, that is BMI between 30 to 40, which is shown in literature with uh, huge publications. Then you have the laparoscopic procedures, but you, when you combine this advanced endoscopic procedures, which I showed you in the last 15 minutes or so, so you can, in fact, address any person from overweight to morbidly obese with these endoscopic procedures, which can be a gastric, duodenal, or the dual procedures. 
so with this i'll end my talk and i i think uh, uh, in this field of bariatric and metabolic endoscopy we as endoscopists have a big role and uh, we have to really concentrate on this and then give a good free uh, amount benefit to the people who are obese and diabetes thank you thank you dr radish your well illustrated lecture and also congratulate to establish a center for uh, obesity and metabolic uh, uh, therapy it is really a uh, grateful in your uh, congratulate for your success so the next speaker is dr uh, professor uh, professor timuwi and she is associate professor of and senior gastric enterologist from Yangon General Hospital and she is one of our rising star from uh, Myanmar gastric enterology environment and she, and she is also expert in the field of uh, failure in pancreatic disease and interventional endoscopy is she is also uh, one of the uh, training from uh, a, uh, AIG and as you all know H pylori is a recognized uh, um, a risk for gastric cancer and Myanmar is still in the high prevalence with antibiotic resistance of H. pylori infection. So that uh, uh, Professor Demoe will deliver the lecture on screening and eradication of H. pylori for gastric cancer prevention. Uh, Professor Demoe, please. Thank you, Professor. Thank you, Professor. Thank you. Please forgive me. My topic is on screening and gastric cancer, uh, screening and eradication of the H. pylori for gastric cancer prevention. As you already know, the gastric cancer, cancer is a fifth leading cause of cancer in the world, and it is the third most com common cause of cancer related mortality worldwide. More than 70% of the gastric cancer cases occur in the developing world, and in which approximately 50% occur in East Asia. Approximately 750,000 persons die. Annually from this malignancy with an estimated 900,000 new cases diagnosed each year. Uh, this figure represents the presence of the stomach cancer by region in 2018, which I, I, which I highlight is the, uh, the incidence of gastric cancer in Eastern Asia, which is the highest among others. Uh, gastric cancer is also common in our country, which is the second uh, most common cancer in both male and female. Gastric cancer is multifactorial and it caused by the interaction of the dietary and lifestyle factors and post genetic factors. Also, uh, helicobacter pylori infection. And the most prevalent is a cat, cat A pathogenicity island. Uh, colonization by H. pylori is the strongest identifying. Rick's factor, which can cause inflammation of the gastric epithelium and which leads to the chronic atigastritis if it is not eradicated. And at least 90% of the gastric cancer are related with H. pylori and it was classified as a class 1 carcinogen by World Health Organization since 1994. A development of the gastric cancer started with the formation of the chronic acid gastritis, which leads to the atrophic gastritis, intestinal metaplasia, dysplasia, and later to the adenocarcinoma. So the H. pylori and gastric cancer rigs in human, uh, metal analysis of the case control studies, tronastic studies, and prospective cohort series indicate that uh, non-cardiac gastric cancer uh, increase it is 5.9 for increase in the H. pylori infected compared to the control. Another study carried out in Japan, including 1526 patient with uh, geroginal ulcer, gastric ulcer, gastric hyperplasia, and then ulcer dysplasia with the mean follow about 7.8 years, found that gastric cancer development was seen in 2.9% of the infected patient and 0% in the control. And H. pylori infection is also associated with the development of the intestinal and diffuse type gastric cancer. 
So with, uh, how can, what can we achieve with H. pylori irradiation? H. pylori irradiation abolishes the inflammatory response. It slows and may arrest the progression of the atrophy and may even reverse atrophy to some degree. It can ab abolish the anti-inflammatory process with inf infiltration of the polymorphonuclear cells. It will take four weeks. And chronic in inflammation with lymphocyte infiltration may persist up to one year. In meta-analysis of the studies, corpus atrophy is potentially reversible, whereas intra-atrophy is most likely irrevers irreversible, and, but intestinal metabolism is irreversible. These are the studies evaluating the effect of the H. pylori irradiation on cancer and cell prevention according to the baseline, according to the different baseline breaks. From these studies, core studies show positive effect of H. pylori irradiation in prevention of the gastric cancer, and randomized control trials show benefit of the H. pylori irradiation on green neoplastic condition and in primary and secondary gastric cancer prevention. A multi-center prospective cohort study from Japan, which is the highest incidence region for the gastric cancer as well as H. pylori, in 2000 to 2007, with a mean follow-up of 5.6 5, 5 years, uh, including case of more than 4,000. 4, the mean age of participant is 53 years, and patients are given choice to receive eradication therapy or only antacid therapy. They are doing annual endoscopy, and eradication rate was found to be 80%. Uh, incidence of the gastric cancer decreased by 40% in the eradication group. In theory, if H, H. pylori eradication is eliminated, eliminated at an early age, for example, when the individuals are healthy or only have mild my gastritis, 89% of the non-cardiac gastric cancer can be eliminated. But in recent meta-analysis, H. pylori irradiation is associated with a significant 35% reduction in the risk of gastric cancer. So we need to decide when should H. pylori irradiation be performed. From the poor analysis of the cyst trials, mostly from Asia with nearly uh, 7,000 participants with a follow-up of 4 to 10 years, a relative risk for gastric cancer after H. pylori irradiation is found to be 0.65 and significant reduction in gastric cancer incidence only when CM pepsin nuclear levels are normal. And cancer originating after irradiation may be related to the extensive atrophic gastritis. And we found that the shorter the time between infection and irradiation, the larger the preventive effect with, with respect to the gastric cancer. Here is a benefit of the mass irradiation of the H. pylori infection in a community-based community study carried out in Taiwan with the population with H. pylori infection and H. pylori infection and H over 30 years. The study endpoint is a to uh, evaluate the pre prevalence of the H. pylori and then the pre-malignant gastric lesions and to compare the malignant lesions and gastric cancer before uh, 1995 to 2003 and after 2004 to 2008 to after 2004 to 2008. In this study, they found that uh, declining in H. pylori infection, which is 78.7% in 2004 to 2008 and now it, uh, at 2016, it is below 10%. A peptic ulcer is declining to 67.4 percent, and gastric atrophy is declining to the 77.2 percent. But no significant benefit was seen with intestinal metaplasia. Intestinal metaplasia is more likely to develop after 50 years of age. They also found the reduction of the gastric cancer in incidence. Uh, they stopped the they start the program at 2004, and then the reduction in gastric cancer in incident, 25% uh, in 2008 and 47% 40, in 2016. Uh, so we need to consider when does the screening 
screening for H, H. pylori makes sense. Uh, screening could prevent 17 to 25 percent of the all gastric cancers in China. It, it is sensible in high risk patients and high, high risk regions like uh, high H. pylori prevalence that is more than or equal to 20 percent. Here are the screening tests for H. pylori, including the invasive test and non invasive test. Uh, this is a table showing the H. pylori prevalence in Myanmar uh, from 2001 to 2017 by our professors and, and by, by our colleagues using the serology, culture, rapid urea test and culture, urea blood test and histology. And H. pylori prevalence was um, ranging from 60 to 80% in various studies, showing that H. pylori is very much common in our H. pylori infection is uh, prevalence is high in our country. Uh, for population screening, uh, serology is less sensitive, less, sen less sensitive and specific, but it is less expensive and maybe more appropriate for the asymptomatic patient. Uh, for urea blood test, it is more sensitive and more specific for symptomatic individual, but for population scre screening, it is costly. Endoscopic biopsy is really not practical, practical for population screening. But in reality, such as endoscopic screening at diverse ages and so institution of the mass screening and eradication may decrease the risk of gastric cancer, but not completely eliminate it. So we need to consider what is the best eradication therapy for the H. pylori. In areas of the height clarithromycin resistant, that is more than 50%, we, sh we should use a bismuth quadruple or non bismuth quadruple concomitant therapies. In areas of the height urea clarithromycin and metronidazole resistant area, bismuth quadruple, quadruple therapy is a recommended first line treatment. And who should get H. pylori eradication therapy here? It's a subject with strong family history of the gastric cancer and subjects with atrophic gastritis, intestinal metaplasia and or dysplasia, and subjects with the low serum pepsinogen levels and patients who underwent endoscopic or surgical resection of the gastric neoplasia and, and simply H. pylori positive patients. Uh, after e eradication, we need to do the endoscopic follow-up in cases of the pernicious anemia with histologically confirmed diagnosis of the type A autoimmune at atrophic gastritis and histology or serological signs of subtotal or total atrophic gastritis with hypo or chlorohydria. We need to do endoscopic follow-up endoscopy with the intervals of the intervals of three to six months in dysplasia patient and two to three, three years in moderate to severe atrophy patients. These are the recommendations from the international consensus meeting. Uh, Asia, Asia Pacific consensus guidelines on gastric cancer prevention stated that there is a pressing need for the development of the national policies to reduce the incidence of the gastric cancer, which is now feasible. And H. pylori screen and treat is a gastric cancer risk reduction strategy in high risk populations. And in high risk populations, screening for H. pylori infection is most effective for atrophic gastritis has developed. From the Judo Global Consensus Report, they state that depending on the epidemiological context, it is appropriate to search and screen for H. pylori gastritis at an age before development of the atrophic gastritis and intestinal metaplasia and H. pylori infected individuals should be offered irrigation therapy unless there are com competing considerations. Another recommendation from the Maastricht Consensus Report, H. pylori irradiation for gastric cancer prevention is cost effective in communities with the high risk for gastric cancer and H. pylori irradiation offers clinical and economic benefits other than gastric cancer prevention and should be considered in all communities. H. pylori screen and treat strategies are recommended in communities at high risk of gastric cancer and 
Screen and treat for H. pylori is recommended in individuals at increased risk for gastric cancer. In conclusion, H. pylori is a major factor for the development of gastric cancer, and 90% of the gastric cancer is related to the H. pylori infection. The best time for screening and irradiation is before the development of the atrophic gastritis, and so the screen and treat strategy for H. pylori should be recommended for ind individuals with increased risk of the gastric cancer. Populations in Eastern Asia have the highest gastric cancer burden in the world, and this region accounts for more than 60% of the all gastric cancer cases worldwide, and so this region is especially well suited for implementing a preventive strategy. Thank you for kind and kind attention. Thank you, Professor Dimowe, your very uh, uh, clear presentation on H. pylori in gastric cancer screening. So I think uh, uh, AIG has a, a red, AIG is re ready to start a live demonstration session. So after live demonstration session, we'll have a question and answer. So please use the chat box for your uh, questions. Is it Oh. So this is the Institute of Gastro and Gastroenterology. And the endoscopy suite, very elegant here. Endoscopy room. Hi. Uh, good morning from the endoscopy rooms. Uh, we start the live transmission. We have four interesting cases, so we'll try and go a little faster to show the principles of what we're doing in these cases. Uh, with me is Dr. Sandeep here. You can see Sandeep. Uh, Dr. Santosh is the chief of anesthesia. I think many of the doctors in Myanmar know him. Mr. Sinvas is our chief technician, and we have a variety of other people helping us with these cases. Uh, this was a patient. Uh, if you have the uh, clinical history of this patient on the slides. We, this was a patient who came to us with obstructive jaundice, progressive cholestatic jaundice with itching and weight loss. Bilirubin was 6.4 milligrams. C99 was very high. A CT scan showed a CHD stricture, which is suggestive of a malignant stricture. A PET scan suggested a tumor at the neck of the gallbladder. It was not the whole gallbladder, only neck of the gallbladder. A ERCP cytology was showing atypical cells, uh, but we also did an endoscopic ultrasound, which was positive for adenocarcinoma. Uh, the plan in this patient normally would have been to put a self-expanding metal stent as a palliation and leave it alone, but we are extending beyond now doing adjuvant therapy also, like for uh, uh, surgery. Here in this case also, we do adjuvant therapy to increase the survival and also to increase the quality of life uh, during this palliation. So first I will do a cannulate this, I, you start seeing the papilla on the picture there. I will cannulate the papilla, do selectively go into the common bile duct. Now for, for cannulation I am using a spintrotome, always for those who are starting ERCP, basic cannulation should be with a spintrotome, not with a, a regular cannula. The reason is clear, I will show you why here. I am putting my cannula out and you can see it is going in this direction. I will ask Mr. Srinivas to actually flex it a little, see, when he flexes it, it goes towards the papillary direction and then becomes easy for me to cannulate. So because we have this capability to flex the standard cannula, we tend to use a spintrotome rather not the cannula. Now the, the spintrotome is in place, we are not injecting any contrast. Again here see the difference, it is going to be a guide wire cannulation. The camera can focus here, Mr. Srinivas has got a guide wire onto the spintrotome. This guide wire is a thermo guide wire we are using, always initial cannulation thermo guide wire 
and uh, you're going to push so he's going to feel carefully and push uh, the guide wire up to see if it's going towards the cbd direction if there's resistance he'll come back then we'll come and adjust the spintotome i'm going to turn a little to the left go towards 11 o'clock position is going to adjust again and then see if it's going to go inside with the feel he'll try and go no this is in the pancreatic duct so he'll come back so it's very important that you use the feel here so i'm going towards 11 o'clock is going to bend the spintotome a little and then go towards uh, the cbd direction and now you see it's gone easily into the cbd now we are in the cbd at this stage i'll advance my spintotome again we're not injecting contrast very important principles don't inject contrast till you are very deep into system because if you inject contrast and subsequently if you can't uh, aspirate it out you will develop cholangitis now can you go deep inside the uh, sinus is going deep inside i'm going i want to see if i get a very easy feel of yeah now i can see the cannula there is uh, the guide wire is uh, actually going very nicely in the left hepatic duct very deep inside so now i'm very comfortable at this stage we'll remove the Terumo guide wire, replace it with a standard O25 guide wire. This O25 guide wire, what we are going to use is much longer than the Terumo wire you use. So it's good for putting your um, um, stents and so on, but not good for initial cannulation because you don't get very good mobility like the Terumo wire with this. Uh, now again, we are not using O35 but O25. That's important to remember because all the wires are now O25. It's easier to use that. There are variety of companies, either Visiglide, Dreamware, and so on. Can inject contrast. Sinus is going to inject contrast. As injecting contrast, I am going to pull my spintotome down to look at the top and bottom portions of this uh, of this uh, structure. Now we are in the left hepatic duct, deep in the left hepatic duct. I am seeing part uh, part of the right also arising from this, so it's a common hepatic duct. And I am going to pull back a little more. Inject. Now we can inject contrast safely. Now you can see now. This anatomy is very important. So in this anatomy, you see the right anterior and the left hepatic duct. The right posterior is still not seen. It doesn't matter because by this time you know that you are going to drain 50% of the liver by just putting a stent into that main duct there. Push the push the wire. Push. So Sinus is pushing the wire still so that we are deep inside. We should not lose our pathway there. And then he's going to inject again to look at the lower end of the structure. The lower end of the structure is somewhere in this part. So you see, you have now defined the upper end and lower end very clearly. It's about three centimeter structure that we are seeing now. As I said, uh, normally we would have put a stent, but what we are going to do in this case is do a radio frequency ablation. And I think this is again important. All your cholangiocarcinomas or neck GB carcinomas, push, push, push. It is better to put a uh, do in addition to putting a stent, do RFA. We, because we have seen that you can increase the survival and the stent block, decrease the stent blockage rate in this patient. So what we are going to use is the Starbed RFA catheter. I'll just show that to you. Uh, RFA is a radio frequency ablation that you give, but this is done uh, by transferring it into heat, heat which is around uh, 75 to 80 degrees. Uh, if you give it too much heat, suppose you give 100 degrees, the tissue gets charred. And is not effective. Between 75 and 80 is what is called slow cooking. When you do slow cooking, you produce a coagulative necrosis of the tissue. Second, so do that, lot of uh, immune modulation occurs, and thus the tumor is also attacked by the body cells. So the effect is not only direct effect of this RFA, but also the immunomodulation that occurs with it. There are also cytokines which are around this area. This is RFA catheter. You can see that it's got four steel electrodes, which are three millimeters apart and uh, totally you get about 2 to 2.5 centimeter burn with this so i'm going to put it in now on the same guide wire this is a seven french catheter so it goes in very easily and uh, at the terminal part when it comes out it's a little stiff so at that point of time i'll ask mr srinivas to pull a little uh, see that he's stuck at the bottom end so he's, he's pulling a little i'm finding it is difficult to get it out this is very important to understand so now i'm changing the direction of the scope now it's come out you can see there's some resistance so you have to turn your scope left and right a little because this catheter sometimes is very stiff now i'm going in deep and you can see this uh, steel electrodes coming out i go in 
uh, and this is seven friends so it goes through very easily nice through the tumor i'm placing it exactly at the stricture side there and then i want you to focus on the generator here the cameraman is going to focus on generator we'll switch it on now it's for two minutes it is for two minutes can you have the yeah then you can see then on the generator you can see we put two minutes wattage of 10 temperature is very important at this point of time i'm not bothered about the wattage it fluctuates but i want the temperature to be between 75 to 80 it's 75 74 you can see now the wattage this is very important you have to maintain between 75 to 80 all the time which is doing the watts can vary now it's zero watts but still the temperature is 75 77 so this is very important to maintain it for at least uh, two minutes and then you can get a very good uh, you can get very good uh, efficacy also it's important not to move your catheter at this stage i'm putting it very static there if the temperature if the catheter moves then what happens is the efficacy goes up look at what's happening on generator very dynamic as the wattage falls down the temperature comes down again the wattage adjusting temperature goes up constantly wattage and temperature are moving and this is the most important this is the difference between this uh, generator and the older ones we are using which was giving a constant temperature and uh, we didn't know uh, constant wattage we didn't know the temperature is co uh, constant or not but with this we know the temperature is constant and uh, efficacy is uh, quite high we are now gone to about 1 minute 16 seconds now 2 minutes is a standard time that has been established although there is no evidence whether 1 minute is 2 minutes is better than 1 minute or 3 minutes so standard is this thing the other thing you look at is impedance the impedance is varying between 35 to 36 if the impedance goes to above 100 that means this tissue is getting charged the machine get automatically switched off so it's very important to maintain a lower impedance here it's only 35 again the older machines we didn't have this impedance capacity so we didn't know whether charging was occurring or not but this is very impedance and temperature sensitive machine so that uh, with this we can give very good um, uh, RFA therapy to these patients so we are almost finished now it's two sec yeah it's two minutes now so after this two minutes is over you have to wait for about 30 seconds before you pull out a catheter the reason is the, the electrodes are very hot you can damage the scope inside so Sinvas is continuing to push the guide wire inside but as soon as this uh, steel electrodes come I'll spray some water on it on the end from the endoscope so that you can cool down the electrodes a little bit and then we'll try and pull it out again pulling it out you have to be careful because you can form a loop there yeah now it's come out so now what we'll do is uh, we'll do the final part of this procedure that is to put a self-expanding metal stent always uh, in a hyalur tumors we tend to use uncovered stent you should not use a covered stent otherwise you can produce cholangitis because you block the other radicals uh, so there are several types of uncovered stents that are available in this particular case I have chosen a nighty stent from Tevu for hyalur tumors you must the length of the stent should be 8 centimeters the ideal diameter is 10 millimeters when it completely opens up so this is an uncovered self expanding metal stents 8 centimeters in length and 10 millimeters when it fully opens up and you can see as we can focus on this yeah so this is 10 millimeters when it opens up 8 millimeters length 80 millimeters that is 8 centimeters length so this is goes this has got a tapered plastic tip so it goes in little easier compared to other things because you find that in the edge of the endoscope sometimes these uh, other stents can get stuck up so I have selected a 90 stent for this I'm not doing a spintrotomy because already the spinter is a little open, but I'm going this stent is going to expand the lower opening. Again a little difficulty at the initial part, but once it goes inside, you can see it uh, goes in little smoothly. I'm using uh, my right and left movement and also the pushing movement. I try and use less of elevator because I don't want to shear the outer sheet. Mostly it's light right and left movement to get very close to the papilla now it adjusts the scope now I am just pulling it back towards the papilla to get it back and then again further the stent goes in I am just watching till I get to the end of the stent which I will show you when we get there and uh, so that you know when to release it so you can see the markers there the top marker is suggestive of uh, 
the upper part of the stent and you can see that uh, now I am going to lower marker as you can see the the lower part of the stent can you see the lower part yeah we will see how it opens up then we can also place it inside there is no problem if the length is a problem but I will see where, as far as possible how Okay. Yeah. Now we are going to open the stent now. Yeah. So what? Again, you can concentrate here. The scene was. You can concentrate on his hand here. He is loosening the tight the knob there, and again he is holding the inner catheter straight, and then opening the outer catheter. Open. Open. Oh, stop, stop. Now I want you to. Now what you must do is focus. The upper part you can see is very high up. The mid part of the stent is a marker there or the stricture side. And lower down you can see is another marker there on the fluoroscopy that is the lower marker. I am going to pull back a little so that you can. Yeah, now now start opening. Now it is going to open so that open. It is going to pull back and as it as is pulling I am also pulling back on the catheter so that I get adequate opening of this. Okay. Keep pulling, keep pulling. So you see, I am concentrating on the lower end on endoscopy picture, and Sinvas is going to finally pull back the whole thing. So stent is deployed now. Now pull back, pull back, pull back, pull back. You can see now the stent nicely employed. So at this point of time, you have to be careful not to suddenly pull back your catheter. Wait, wait for the stent to open up. You can see the center of the stent is still still tight. We have to open and wait a little more, and then gradually try and pull back. And see, now we pull back on. So I'm near pulling back. I'm near the stent, so that uh, the stent doesn't move at all. You can see good flow here. Okay, so we finish this case now. We'll take up questions at the end after all the cases. We should move to the next room where we have Mohan is ready with uh, a spiral endoscopy case. Thank you. Then. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, Dr. Mohan. Good morning, Dr. Thanten. How are you? Are everybody okay there? Good morning. Good morning. So, uh, we have this uh, 42 year old female who has presented to us with uh, recurrent episodes of subacute intestinal obstruction. She was admitted with the uh, uh, complaints of crampy abdominal pain and diarrhea and weight loss. We are strongly suspecting. Uh, inflammatory bowel disease and that's why we evaluated her with upper J and colonoscopy which were almost normal and we saw some thickening of uh, proximal intestine or uh, uh, distal jejunal and proximal ileal thickening on CT and uh, so this makes us to do an enteroscopy to interrogate the intestine to uh, see what is the cause of that thickening and why she is presenting again again with subacute intestinal obstructions. So, up till now we were doing uh, deep enteroscopy using balloon assisted enteroscopes which were quite cumbersome, time taking, the scopes were long and uh, the which makes us to use accessories dedica dedicated for longer scopes and the therapeutic channel was also 2.8 which will not allow us to do many therapeutic procedures. So now we have another good enteroscope. This is known as uh, motorized spiral enteroscopy, which has got an over tube on the uh, distal end of the scope, and this over tube rotates by this motor, and this motor gets switched on by a foot pedal, and if you push a foot pedal on the uh, uh, forward position, that the right foot pedal, like an accelerator in a car that rotates the spiral in a clockwise fashion and this propels the scope forward while if I push the backward rotation uh, pedal the spiral rotates in the anti-clockwise direction and this pulls back the scope so overall the uh, function of this uh, over tube is to convert this rotational energy into the linear energy and this propels the scope so we are as a as an endoscopist so this is the first time we are using uh, a self-propelled endoscope 
this over tube is 3 cm wide. So that is why we have to preemptively dilate the esophagus uh, up till by the boogie dilatation we have dilated this up till and that is why you can see some trauma over there up till 18 mm and now once I have inserted the scope I will start the forward movement and you can see my scope traveling down into the esophagus and I am just holding my scope I am not doing anything I am just pressing the pedal and this is propelling the scope downwards into the into the stomach you can see now we have come to the stomach and then we are reaching to the antrum and soon we will see the pyloric opening and this is the pyloric opening and then we go into the D1 <coughs> so the ma major problem in this scope is to negotiate the ligament of treats <coughs> so that once you do that then this scope is like a cakewalk so I am just trying to negotiate the scope into the ligament of treats now and you can see I am gone into the distal duodenum and I will switch off the CO2 now to make this switch off the CO2 please and I will push water push water you can see there is a dedicated water channel so I will keep the intestinal distension to the minimum and drown my scope into the water which makes this intestine to desufflate and then you can see my scope I am not even pushing I am just driving a car or driving my scope into the intestine and by foot pedal it is just swimming into the water and going deep into the small intestine so this is a very nice technology which makes this enteroscopy procedure very easy and you can just go up till to the cecum in 20 to 25 minutes and you can see the major uh, uh, technical tips are you don't inflate the intestine so like EOS air is the enemy of enteroscopy more the distended intestines are less effective is the over tube so over tube need to fix the intestine and if you are you can push water so I am pushing the water and inflating the intestine with water not with air and that is why the over tube is gripping the intestine more efficiently and you can e easily see the forward movement of the scope I mean, uh, is the pictures visible there? Do you push the scope? No, not even. See that? You can see my hand. Can you show my hand, please? I am just, you can see I am just holding, giving the direction like a steering in the car. And my only job is to push the pedal. Can you show the pedal here, please? You can so you don't it. push? No. I just okay. give a, just a simple nudge uh, a small uh, okay leave it so then we will go back to the you can see here very very easy so only drawback in this procedure is those patients who are post operative and where we are suspecting small bowel adhesions there we don't have the tactile feedback push water if we don't have the tactile feedback then we may cause some uh, perforation if we are not experienced enough otherwise uh, uh, this procedure is very very efficient what, keep on putting water please can you adjust the speed the speed yes so by the degree of pressure on the pedal is directly proportioned to the the, the speed of rotation of the over tube alright <coughs> what about the learning curve? 
so learning curve i feel is around 15 cases but but those who are have already done the entroscopy by balloon assisted entroscopy you can be uh, well versed with this technique in first 5 to 6 cases so here i am having a blind spot at this moment of time i will increase increase the co2 a bit try to get the road map come back a bit see that i am not able to see the lumen now so i am just coming back i am going again now i am seeing the lumen so that is the lumen again in my view very nice very nice yes. So we'll go back again. I'm just pushing a scope a bit, not like a push and pull entroscopy of balloon assisted entroscopy, but just trying to find my way. <coughs> and you can see here, we can see now the scope, the lumen of intestine. so once the uh, the movement is not there so i change the position of patient to supine and the in, in in small bowel entroscopy you have to take a lot of help from your assistants in massaging the abdomen because in in, in yeah supine so you are just changing the position and then give some pressure on the abdomen and then we move forward is that you need to change the patient position patient position yes and then give abdominal pressure so this is what we do in colonoscopy once uh, we are getting too much of looping we change the position and then again <coughs> uh, give pressure on the abdominal wall and uh, try to deloop so similar way we do in entroscopy also so can you show the fluoroscopy please how long does this last to reach the camera uh, area around 20 25 minutes uh, usually short can you show the fluoro please fluoro you can see now here we are quite deep into the intestine so i'll yes. just reduce the loop from the stomach you can see i'm reducing the loop into the stomach and straightening the scope and then we'll go again so i'll keep on doing this meanwhile we can go to the next room if if they are ready so the whole yeah so we'll go to the next room and come back keep on shifting from room to room so that we can show you many cases so whole aim of this uh, live demonstration is to show you the technique what are the new techniques available and we saw this how smoothly it's gone to the distal jejunum and now we are uh, just trying to negotiate this scope into the distal uh, jejunum and ileum okay okay yeah. okay, okay. you to off can we switch uh. hello sushi hi good morning hello everybody hello can that can you hear me i am sandeep hello hello hello, hello. Can you hear us? We hear, we hear clearly. Hello. No. Sushil. The silence again. Satya. Not here. Oh no, it's on. 
Hello? Can you hear us? Get a mic on, no? We don't hear you. Okay. We don't hear you. So we'll keep talking then if they're able to listen to us. Sir, they are able to hear you, sir. Please go ahead, sir. Yeah. Okay. So we're not able to hear you, but we'll continue what we are doing. Let me introduce my younger colleague, Dr. Asif. Hi. He's, uh, Dr. Shujat Asif will be doing an EOS on a patient. Can we have the history on the screen? Anurad, can you show the history on the screen, please? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, you can read. Uh, he is a young male patient with a history of right upper quadrant pain and jaundice since two weeks was referred for further management. Uh, we did an LFT which showed an altered uh, obstructive pattern with bilirubin 20 mg with alkaline phosphatase 210 international units. Uh, we, uh, he also underwent an CT which showed a distal CBD pathology, a filling defect probably. So we are quickly doing an US and assessing the CBD and uh, uh, distal end of the CBD and pancreas. Uh, to see what is the cause of this obstructive jaundice. So, uh, for the for the sake of time, I have already introduced the scope. Uh, this is a radial the, US scope. Uh, this is a radial US Olympus scope. Uh, it's on, uh, in the stomach, showing you the uh, left lobe of the liver and aorta. I am just pushing down. So, Asif is using both yeah. endoscopy view as well as US view to glide into the Duodenum. Actually, I am near the antrum, I am just entering the pylorus. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I have just glided into the uh, D1, uh, D1, D2 junction just to see the CVD pathology. Uh, I will put some water into the duodenum so that this uh, the CVD is clearly seen. And there is no air, air interface. Okay. I think inflate the balloon, you will see it better then. Yes. Ah. Okay. There is some little air inside. Okay. No. There is air in the balloon. Yes, sir. Okay. So that is the CVD. So that is uh, that's the CVD, lower end of the CVD. Where, uh, and can you see the upper part? Okay, can we go yeah. up and see the? Yeah, yeah. no, I will just trace it upwards. Uh, we are just pulling out the scope. Uh, the lower end of CBD. Yeah. Okay, keep going up, keep going up. That's a thick wall CBD. Thick wall CBD, we could see. And, and there, there is a big stone in the almost in the distal mid CBD portion. Yeah, this is the mid part or the upper part. Is it in the cystic duct? Can you just trace up and yeah, down? I am just tracing upwards to see if it is in the cystic duct or in the CBD. So that is the gallbladder area. The gallbladder is here. This is a CBD. Upper this is the upper okay. part of the CBD. And it's here. Okay. Okay. So, we see a big stone. The patient has a disproportionately high bilirubin. High bilirubin yeah. It is 20 which is quite high for a CBD stone unless it is tightly impacted. This one is high up. So let us do an EFCP and see what is going on. So at least we confirm. The doubt was between malignancy and stone. And the fact that bilirubin was so high, that is why we doubted the possibility of a malignancy. So this looks to be the CBD here. Yeah, yeah it looks to be CBD. CBD here. here. Yeah, okay. And then, yeah. This yeah, is the CBD. Yeah. So let us change over the scope to oh, the CBD. Thank you. Thank nice thank demonstration. Thank you, sir. The wall of the CBD. So, we are still not able to hear you, but uh, we can discuss that these are situations in real life scenario which come up that uh, yes. a bile duct obstruction is not very obvious uh, on, uh, on uh, clinical assessment and that is why we do further investigations which can be in the form of MRCP or a CT scan or an EOS. And yes. the advantage of doing EOS and ERCP almost same time is that Dr. Santosh has given sedation and in the same sedation we confirm and treat. So suppose it is a malignancy, we can take a biopsy at the same time and we can now try to remove the stone. 
Thank you. So that's called as EOS ERCP interface. Panthan, can you hear us now? Yes, yes, yes. yes. Okay, okay. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry we had loss of communication, it was one way and I think you could hear us but we couldn't, now we can interact while we are doing the case. So that's Hello. the ERCP scope going in. Hello. I am also trying to look at the lower esophagus for any viruses because disproportionately high bilirubin also makes us suspect uh, uh, cirrhosis in addition. There is no PHG also, it is probably all related to stone and it is very rare for a stone to cause such a high bilirubin uh, unless there is another pathology which we are not able to pick up. Vitamin K, dear, no? vitamin K. So that is the papilla which is small. Will you vitamin K? We also check this vitamin K, uh, sorry, potham in time which is normal. Uh, that's an important point acid that you raised. Yes. I think. Because if you suspect cirrhosis and you try to remove the stone, you have to be careful that coagulation parameter should be normal. So this is a virgin papilla and Yes. Shaking just a minute. Wire out could be tip out. Fine. Good day. Yes. Okay. Bend, bend. Think to the bend. Check. Maybe a drop of contrast? Yeah, sure. This guy? Green? Chip. Not green? Chip. Okay. Okay, let me pull back. Chip. It's an angle tip wire which is what I wanted. Because then it can bend, bend, full bend. Chip. I'll try. Sometimes little contrast may help. So what kind of cut wire you use now? Yeah. So Srinivas is manipulating the guide wire. <coughs> Is there a strip, okay. sir? No oh, fresh. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. Yeah, so there is not a strip, sir, but bend. in the lower end, what happened is there is a small S shape part of PBD and that S shape makes it more difficult to get in especially when there is a obstruction a higher up you have a difficulty so Sandeep is now using an angular angulated uh, guide wire a thermo wire and Srinivas okay, is uh, rotating it clockwise anti-clockwise so I think this is interesting to see because this is where the difficult cannulation to overcome if you do, don't have yeah. a thermo guide wire what is the alternative uh, you can use a video now they have gone deep inside as you can see if you don't have a thermo wire you can use an angled uh, acrobat or an angled uh, visig line uh -huh. contrast but the thermo is very cheap you can get it easily yes i think thermo is an important armament area when we can see the stone there yes we do yeah yes we do okay so it's in the bile duct and uh, okay so let's do a string trot me. It's at the same area where cystic duct is taking off. So the doubt of Mirizi still remains. Let's see if it's mobile. 
So what do you think we should do? Big swing trot me or or you want a CRE? Can you have to measure the stone size? Raju? Stone. Diameter stone. CRE kare? It's very big. Screen? Oh, okay. 10 mm. 11 mm. 11.1. And the CBD diameter? Because the stone has not moved from there, it's fixed looking there. Uh, that's the only thing. Okay. Clara, please. Yeah. So we'll dial it up to 12 mm because this bile duct uh, is about I think 10 mm or so, and so is the stone which is about 11.1. The gallbladder has got filled up, which now excludes the meridies because if the stone is in the cystic duct, generally filling of the gallbladder doesn't happen. So using a, a CRE balloon, 12 to 15, but we'll dilate it up to 12 mm first and see how it goes. And coach, we use mechanical lithotripter after that. No, I'll use a balloon to to drag it down. That's our first mm -hmm. preference. Mm -hmm. I think our requirement for mechanical lithotripsy is has drastically come down for for a variety of reasons. One that we have an ESWL machine which is very strong, and uh, second we also have the laser lithotripsy with cholangioscopy, which by which we can break the stones. And mechanical lithotripsy is very time-consuming process, and sometimes no. It can be done. That's one option. If you have no other option available, open inflate, please. So I'm using only saline to inflate the balloon. I've done a small swing trot me, but I'll do a large caliber balloon dilatation. Yes. <coughs> so I keep a watch on the on the time. Yes, 12 mm. I want to keep it inflated for at least a minute. Another one minute. Yeah, one minute. So we can one take minute. questions now if there is any. While uh, <laughs> I think this is the best time to discuss questions, just like the trainee was discussing during the RFA when two minutes of uh, RFA catheter was in situ. <laughs> And all of the string trough is. Hamdi, can we go to Mohan's room yeah. just for a second? Sure, sure, sure. sure. We can go to the other room and yeah. come back. Yeah, while we are doing this, that's okay. a good idea. Mohan, you're on. <laughs> on your own yeah okay so we are just progressing and i am encountering some co2 can you on see uh, in patient who especially have subacute intestinal obstruction sometimes we find uh, many obstacles not only the stricture but also the adhesions the kinks which makes this endoscopy slightly difficult and you can see now we got through one of the kink and again we are moving forward good thing about this is by the end of this procedure you still are fresh while if you do a balloon assisted endoscopy for 2 hours you are not good for any other work in the department for next It's a tedious job for me. So <laughs> <laughs> at least somebody is thinking about uh, you know that endoscopist also. Ergonomics are very very important to keep you fit, and this endoscope is definitely a a, a blessing for an endoscopist at least. Good for. Uh, 
patients also because you can do pan endoscopy we have been doing balloon assisted endoscopy since long and our mohan, plan, mohan i think sandeep has got a big uh, spinteroplasty okay. done okay. maybe the audience will be interested in looking at yeah, this yeah, sure. sandeep you want to show the big hole you created sorry luxurious here yeah. so i have removed the balloon now after keeping it inflated for more than 1 minute to accommodate mohan <laughs> and now we'll use a stone retrieval balloon to drag out the stone kya dikha raha hu hey it's a very large stone and you think it will come out so I, uh, while you are talking i made it to 13.5 so 1 minute of uh, 12 mm and 1 minute of 13.5 okay so total 2 minutes of dilation has been done yeah. and then we gradually deflated seeing there is no bleeding and i'm trying to not inflate too much co2 so empty press of recurrent cholangitis or worm infestation because we experience a patient with white spherectomy and she has recurrent a worm infestation and so that's an advantage with uh, sphincterplasty that this will stenose after some time not stenose but at least close down partially that is a worm infestation ascariasis yeah ascariasis is a common thing they they try to go into the holes which are open <laughs> here comes the stone oh fantastic very nice very good okay protect the stones so we'll do one more quick sweep and then i think we are done with the procedure keep a watch on the opening so sandeep you can hear the watcher clapping that's going on <laughs> uh, i have a shoot is real time <laughs> yeah, <it's real. laughs> okay. Next stone. Thank you. You want to do nacrylic polymer? Yeah, that's what that's what we are doing now. So as we are dragging the balloon down, Shinwas is injecting. Please inject Shinwas. Continue injecting. So you see that the bile duct is clear now, and my balloon is coming out quite easily. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah. Okay. I think we are done with the case and sir. Very nice job. Yeah. I think we go to Mohan now. Mohan seems to be getting to the sea come now. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Mohan, you are ready? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, you are on the screen, Mohan. Okay. So now we can again we are finding a kink there. So it's not like a very. Try to get through this kink, and you can see now I am sucking. So, th so these are the, some of the techniques where you have to get through this kink. So we are moving, moving now, and you can see some inflammatory. Uh, this looks like some erosions. Is that Crohn's or? No, this one. Uh, yeah, this is Crohn's disease. If you feel it's not move forward, so you you reduce your speed and you yeah, you know. I, I reduce the speed because I am finding this intestine not very pliable. Mm -hmm. At the end, uh, it becomes rigid, and I it becomes see. rigid. Then the you can see some scarring there. So I'm a bit worried about, uh, you know, uh, the, the prerequisite of this type of endoscope is that the small intestine should pleat on the scope, and if the if there is a lot of inflammatory bowel disease or post-op adhesions, then this pleating becomes uh, slightly less efficient, and then. Uh, uh, you have to be very very careful i am not like doing like in the proximal jejunum i did i was collapsing the intestine and going uh, without any trouble because the intestines were moving and here as i am coming to the distal bowel the i think this is not moving that well so i am very very careful i am not very fast i am trying to see around the corners and see that then so mohan what is the risk of perforation the audience wants to know yeah so uh, if if the major advantage of this scope is one is it is self propelled but the drawback the flip side is that you do not have tactile feedback 
लाइक इफ यू आर नेगोशिएटिंग अ टाइट किंक और बेंड इन बलून असिस्टेड एंट्रोस्कोपी यू विल फील दैट बट हियर आई एम नॉट फीलिंग दैट बट हियर द मशीन हैज बीन गिवन यू नो a sensor at the tip of the uh, see that now we have seen a ulcer there you can see that that yes, ulcer yes, very nice so that is a, yes. uh, so this is a uh, now because the intestine is kinked and we are finding this ulcer and scarring you can see the scar there yes yes, yes. so if i try to negotiate too much without a tactile feedback i can perforate so i have to be very careful now we have reached to the diagnosis and I don't think going further will help in this patient because we wanted a diagnosis and we got the diagnosis and because this machine is having a sensor there if it encounters a resistance you can see there on your screen can you see the screen there is a spiral rotation force that is written so that force if if the if the force goes beyond a level the spiral rotation stops so fine, fine. if i try to go now uh, uh, this this will stop so what i will do is i'll take biopsy from there and then i'll show you how to withdraw the scope i will not go into that and in, more into that and you can see one more ulcer there at the yes. at 5 o'clock position you can see i don't know whether you can see now from a distance <coughs> so that's a stricture there <laughs> if you can see uh, uh, i am not uh, so this is the area of stricture no you can see you can see that ulcer there two ulcers and a stricture so this is a definite crohn's disease so aim of the endoscopy was to know the cause of recurrent saio and uh, we know that now going further will not be helpful uh, uh, we'll take the biopsies for the crohn's uh, assessment and the good thing about this is even if open even if the the intestine the scope is too deep still the passage of biopsy forceps is very easy that right. becomes important because of the therapeutic channel the therapeutic channel here is 3.2 mm which allows us to pass thick biopsy forceps and also uh, in problem with balloon assisted endoscopy was uh, there will be many loops and can you show the screen please even into the uh, <coughs> ileum we have gone into the ileum but <coughs> the number of loops are less why it happens is because of the totally different technology being used in spiral endoscopy we pull the intestine towards ourselves and in push and pull double balloon or single endoscopy we push and pull push and pull so the number of loops which are formed in balloon assisted endoscopy are more and there are more many loops it is difficult to pass the accessories while in spiral endoscopy the number of loop formations are less therapeutic channel is larger that is why passage of accessory is much easier so we got the diagnosis and you can see many ulcers now you can see yes. at 12 o'clock position also see that many aftas also yeah so these are aftas ulcers with normal intervening mucosa with scarring i think we have enough evidence of crohn's disease in this patient and now i am coming back you can see i am pushing the back paddle and i am gradually releasing the intestines gradually <clears throat> so you can have a full uh, examination of the small bowel like this this is three should measure the length of the yeah so, so uh, Uh, that is not good for i mean that's not relevant for clinical purposes but if you are doing a study then you can count this number of the folds can you see the fold i can count the number of folds 1 2 3 4 this four so somebody from behind if i have a research assistant 
I will ask him to count the number of folds. Like this, you can see one, two, three, four, five, six, six folds in this. So I will say six into point nine. That is five point four centimeters. So, mm -hmm. so if you co count the number of folds multiplied by zero point nine, that gives mm -hmm. you in centimeters. So you have to keep on counting these folds, which is very cumbersome to do. And that is the nearest way by which you can correctly identify the length of bowl. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think we will finish this case, and we'll go to the last case in the next room. we are we are ready with uh, a very nice uh, interesting case again uh, by dr uh, reddy i think let's stop the move on the yes. next time you buy an endoscope yes yes of course yes. <laughs> thank you so uh, we are back to the ercp first room uh, we are we have a patient who had came with obstructive jaundice uh, weight loss uh, ca99 was elevated an ercp was done Uh, there was a small stone which was removed. In addition, brushings were done from the stricture, but uh, you can see the MRCP pictures here. There's a hyalur stricture. Brushing from this showed uh, that this was uh, low-grade dysplasia. So looks like a malignancy on MRCP, but uh, by unfortunately, as usual, the biopsies and brushings came negative. So the plan is to do a spicolangioscope to confirm the diagnosis. Uh, what I'm doing, I'm using a new ERCP scope, the 190 series from Olympus, and you can see if you can, we've got a disposable cap. So this is a disposable cap that comes with this. So if you're buying a new set of scopes, I'd recommend this because this disposable cap keeps it clean. The chance of cross uh, trans infections uh, uh, are very less with this. So that's the reason why we switched on to this. It makes it a little more bulkier, but I think it makes it safer for the patient. So we are now intubating this patient. Uh, so this patient had an ERCP two days back, uh, had a negative or diagnosis which are not definite for a malignant stricture. So we are going to recheck with a spice scope. So as we go, you know, a lot of blood here. This bleeding indicates that the previous spin clot we must have caused some problem or any other lesion is there. We will check that. So this is interesting. So you can see a lot of blood in the stomach here. So I'm going to go into the second part of the day. No, no. Let's inspect the sphincterotomy site. I think there is a definite. Yeah, there is a clot there. Can you see this, Tantana? So the previous sphincterotomy site, there is a clot. So what I'm going to do is to flush it now and see where, if we have any visible vessel or anything. I can see some pulsations there. Can we use a flush? So we can do two ways of flushing. We can use directly, or we can use a sphincterotomy and flush. Through the spintrotome. So let's look at where this clot is. What exactly is happening there? Ah, flush. So I'm just flushing, flushing, flushing. You can see a vessel, visible vessel there. Yeah, you can see that. Can you see the bleeding site now clearly? At the apex, yeah, at the apex, yeah. See that when you when you wash out, you can see see that see that see that yeah, very nicely seen. Yeah, so you can see that nicely. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to do the coab grasper. That's the bleeding site. Okay. So the first important thing in all this bleeding is to flush and look at the bleeding site, identify the bleeding site. We are next going to do the coab grasper. This is a little difficult to manipulate the side wing scope, but this is probably the best instrument to use here. So I'm using a coab grasper, the smaller size one, and see if I can get it out of the side wing scope. So if I can grasp that area, I can very nicely stop. Open. I'm going to open it. I'm not under view because it's difficult to have elevated opening. Okay. So you can see here. So I'm going to use uh, a soft coagulation. It's easy to manipulate. Uh, not so easy. It's difficult. Because it's very stiff. Yes. Even if you burn the duodenum above, there's no problem. So now I'm just going to go down a little and then come down. 
Okay, open. So when you open something, you have to be careful you don't snare the vessel. Yeah. So now I am going to use another area also. Open. And then we will flush out. So slightly to the left, I am going to go to the previous site. Slightly out. Close. So you see it's not, it's a little bulky there, but hopefully we stop the bleed, but I'll open. You can't push it very easily, so I'm using the up and down or close. Open. So now, we, yeah, it's open. So now I am going to take out this, clean this, meanwhile again use a spindletone to flush and see if the bleed has stopped. Huh? One of the things you can do in these cases also is to put a self expanding completely covered stand. Unfortunately, the Hylar timber you can't do. Otherwise, that's another easy option. There is still some bleed. See that from the side here. Huh? From this side, from the bottom side. Yeah, yeah, you can see that. I can see that now nice. I will go and catch this side now. Is the bottom there. Instead. Which one? Peter probe. Yeah, you can use a gold probe, heater probe and all are no longer using. We have a gold probe ready. In case this can't be manipulated, we'll use a gold probe. The gold probe also, uh, 7 frame gold probe we can use, but the precision is not as high as this. Open. This is the area. But this is a second. Uh, I'm going to get my... See, uh, what I'm doing is I'm using my up and down knob to get to that area because I can't push it very high. So I'm using my up and down knob. Elevator use is also stiff. Very stiff, very stiff. Close. Okay, that's the area. Open. Yeah, little on the bottom. Open. So I am cleaning that area and now we have to flush it because the spot there you can see very nicely in this area. We will we'll, we'll take it out, wash it again. I am using a syringe to wash. Can you see the bleed down, bleeding site? Yes, yes. The bleed, lower dot. Open. Again, I am using my elevate, I am just using the elevator to keep it up and using the forward knob, up and down knob to actually and then pushing the scope back a little, close. I think this patient should have endomethacin also rectally because we are burning a lot around the pancreatic orifice area, post ERCP pancreatic chances. Open. Yeah. Hopefully it stops. We will flush. Yeah. So that is the area. So you can see now it has stopped completely. Okay, so we have to change our plan now. Initially, we thought we'll do a spy scope, but I think we'll change our plan. We'll, uh, I think, put an NBT and come out in this patient because uh, again, too much manipulation there. We'll put an NBT, let it heal for two, three days, and then we'll go and do a spy. Okay.
Tan tan ayu agree with the plan or ini. We have Sandeep and Mohan here asking them also. Yes, yeah, the right idea. Sir. Yeah. So now I'm just putting. Oh, thank you. I will be very gentle with the spindotome here. He is manipulating uh, with uh, termo wire. Uh, sometimes it is better to use a straight termo wire in this situation. Yeah, now we have gone in. No, no. Gone in. Yeah, that's okay. Now change to regular one. Huh? But we don't have a diagnosis, no? Huh? You don't want to stay? So you want me to put a plastic stent? Plastic temperance stent? Yeah. So Mohan is suggesting a plastic temperance stent. We can do that. Can you inject some contrast there? We can put an NBT or a stent. So Mohan is suggesting a stent. So we'll do. Yeah. Now you can see the obstruction there in the hilar area. We have got both the left and the right anterior duct. So a single temperance stent is enough. So. Huh? Uh, why? Why we change the wire now to ten ten? Ten twelve is better. We just trying to see what size of the ten. It also depends on the individual's uh, stature. The individual is very short. Ten friends, ten centimeter ten is enough to go across obstruction. We we'll measure it. Can fluoroscopy picture and measure the ten friends? We can take a picture here, and what we can do is we can actually measure it. And uh, length, 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 length. Length, length, we can measure. Yeah. Can we do that? Yeah. Yeah. Now I'll push the scope inside. Yeah. Measure. So we are measuring from below to the top. It is seven centimeters approximately. Eighty-seven. Eighty-seven. Huh? Eighty-seven. Eighty-seven. So nine. So ten should be okay. Yes, yeah. Yeah. So let this bleed everything settle down. Then we can go ahead and do a later, a definitive study to decide what to do in this patient. Yes. So sometimes we have to change the plan dynamically when there's a problem like this. This is just, uh, uh, I mean, I think in the endoscopy everything is very dynamic. We wanted to demonstrate a spike colangioscopy, but now if you go on manipulating here with a spy, the chance of Opening up another vessel is there, so let this all settle down, and then maybe some other time uh, after about a week's time we can go for go ahead with the spy. So you don't take the biopsy. We already done the cytology and biopsies from internal part of the structure, which was negative. That's the reason why we thought we'll do a spy. But this time I don't want to manipulate too much using a biopsy forceps and all, because again bleed will open up again. My main. Uh, um, Concern this time is to tackle this bleed, tackle the cholangitis, and come back later and do uh, spy to get definitive diagnosis. Again, very important in endoscopy is safety. Patient safety is very important. So this is a little structure here which I am getting resistance. I will try and. Thank you. So now it's gone above the structure, and you can see we are above the structure here. Ah, huh. oh, take up. So this is 10 centimeter tension stand that we put in. This will be okay to relieve the patient's uh, cholangitis, settle down in the bleed, and then we can go in later. Okay? Nice, yeah, very nice. It's across the street, sir. Yeah, across the street, right. So, I think we come to the end because it's just exactly in time. I don't know whether we have time for questions. Uh, maybe Sandeep yeah, and Mohan yeah. can join. Yeah, Mohan. Yes, well, we have some questions, a yeah. number of questions. Yeah. So you're going to answer the questions here, yeah. or? Oh uh, yeah, you can. You can. All of us are here, so mics are there for everybody. Andy, for Mohan, 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 for Moh
We have to be very careful because the chance of producing pancreatitis is very high. In these patients, we can we put a pancreatic stent and then do RFA. If the lesion is uh, also in the right hepatic duct, you have to be very careful because the right hepatic artery is very close. So there is some recommendation that better do an endoscopy, um, intraductal ultrasound, map out the artery and then do the RFA. So these are the two danger areas that we have. Also near the cystic duct, uh, of not serious, the most uh, com com complication is cholecystitis because the lesion was near the cystic duct. If you near the cystic duct, you have to be careful because after RFA edema comes and the cystic duct closes and cholecystitis will occur. So these are the three precautionary areas. Now contraindication as such is not there except that if the patient has extensive disease, metastasis in the liver and all, there is no point in doing RFA because the lifespan of this patient is uh, very short. So if the patient is on a pacemaker, then we have to get the help of our cardiologist. Uh, either switch it off at that time when you are doing uh, or uh, we have to be very careful with short bursts of uh, thing because it is a continuous 2 minutes that you are putting in electrical current. Uh, so these are the main uh, contraindications and precautions that we should take. What about uh, you can tell about the metal stent inside and doing RFA through that? Yeah, so if you have a metal stent inside then the stent gets blocked. To de-block the stent you can do RFA. But actually to attack the tumor RFA is not very good because we have seen that uh, the strength of the burn is doesn't go across very well through a metal stent. But if the tumor is into the metal stent to de-block you can use RFA. Do you need to dilatation before the RFA blows? No, you should not do. Very important. If you do dilatation, then RFA is not effective because RFA catheter is 7 French. It has to fit snugly against the tumor. It is a contact uh, injury that occurs. So no contact is there. For example, if you put a 10 French stent and come and do RFA, or if you dilate with RFA, then uh, it is not effective. Recently, a company is developing a balloon RFA catheter. When you get that, then of course you can do a dilatation and then do. Thank you. So you always put the uh, sub expandable stent after RFA? No, not uh, so. We can even put a plastic stent. If you want to repeat the RFA, we don't do this here, but many centers repeat the RFA after two weeks. In that case, we put a plastic stent and come back. But I think this is not so effective because once you put a plastic stent, the stricture dilates RFA is not so effective. So I would recommend that you do RFA and put a self expanding metal stent for complete palliation in this patient. <laughs> So how, how long do you need to repeat? How long do you need to wait for repeat RFA? Oh, usually 14 days. 14 days. Thank you, sir. So we'll be back for the question and answer session. Yeah. Okay. After we back to the place. Finish that. Thank you. So you want to answer here or? No, we can answer here. It's yes. finished. Finish yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. So we have uh, quite, a uh, quite a number of uh, questions to uh, Dr. D. N. Reddy, sir. Uh, this is the PT, uh, RT PCR test. Do you proceed the procedure with one time negative result or do you test again after 72 hours? Yeah. So this is an interesting question. Actually, uh, the positivity of RT PCR is only 70%. It can be negative in 30% of the cases due to a variety of reasons including uh, the technique and also the test inherently has got a sensitivity of say 80 to 90 percent. So you can still be uh, negative in a positive patient. So what we do is a patient who is suspected symptoms are very classical, we would then uh, also do a chest x-ray. So it has been shown that if we do a CT chest and uh, CT chest can be positive, RT-PCR can be negative. So the small 30 percent group can be covered if you do a routine uh, CT chest in these patients. Uh, whereas if you are doing a rapid spot test, then the positivity is only 50 to 60 percent. You have to be very careful because the negative spot test does not rule out the disease. Especially if the patient is symptomatic, we do not recommend that. To use negative spot test, symptomatic, do not do the procedure till you get a uh, chest CT done. Especially if you are doing a more invasive procedure. The next, the, the next question is, is COVID rapid test is mandatory before procedure in your country? Yeah. The rapid is yeah. not available. Uh, should we use N95 or surgical mask, uh, which must be double surgical mask not? So there is no legal uh, legality involved, there is no law saying that you must do the procedure. But in our unit, we, we made a uh, sort of procedure that all patients getting intervention like ERCP, EUS, uh, USD POEM should have 
RT or endoscopy should have an RT PCR done. Without that, we don't do the procedure. Routine endoscopy colonoscopy we don't do, but uh, routine endoscopy colonoscopy is, it, you can implement rapid spot test because you get the result within half an hour. The problem with RT PCR it takes 24 hours, so you can't uh, wait so long for a routine endoscopy colonoscopy. That's why we're not implementing it. There's a divided opinion. Uh, in uh, many European countries now they're doing endoscopy colonoscopy without RT PCR, but many centers in US are starting to do RT PCR for all the cases, even routine endoscopy, colonoscopy. So I would recommend that at least interventional cases, you have to do RT-PCR. Other cases, you need not. If you have facility for rapid, uh, uh, that is point of contact test, you can go ahead. Uh, I think the statement has been made by SGI. Yeah. So you want to, com you want to comment? So, uh, so this was in the beginning of the pandemic. Uh, the statement from SGI was that we should uh, only do in emergency cases, and uh, patients who are uh, in the uh, are uh, serious, but elective patients like routine dyspeptic patients coming for endoscopy and colonoscopy yeah. were avoiding in the mm -hmm. beginning of epidemic. But as uh, the epidemic progressed and we knew what the, the nature of the disease was, uh, we started uh, having a mm -hmm. individual uh, uh, guidance at each center. And the current understanding and the application that has been followed in most centers in India is that they do RT-PCR like what we do for all the invasive procedures, ERCP, EUS, enteroscopy, POEM and so on and so forth. For routine endoscopy and colonoscopy, depending on patient and the unit, if they are willing to pay that much and wait for a day to get the reports and then do it, then you can tighten it. Otherwise, use standard precautions. Your hygiene should be there. Everybody should have mask and cap and use standard precautions, keep minimum people in the room so that the spread of disease should not occur. Also, we have started using a plastic, what yeah. Dr. Reddy is about to say. Yeah, I think this is very important, more than all the testing, I would recommend that all endoscopies in Myanmar, this is just a transparent plastic uh, sheet available everywhere. Just take the transparent plastic sheet and what you do is, to the, to the tip of the transparent plastic with one edge, we just put a plaster here. So this plaster, uh, we'll make this like a small tunnel here, see this? And then this can be covered on the patient, patient, and through this uh, tunnel that we have, we can put your endoscope through, endoscope through. So you see, mm -hmm. then the camera can go down, you can see how the patient is covered here. So the patient head is covered, you can put your endoscope through the, through the tunnel here. So it's very simple, just take a plastic sheet, regular plastic sheet, regular plastic sheet, just put a plaster here to make a small tunnel and this becomes a tunnel. So this I think is, um, in my opinion, is the most best way to protect yourself. Even if the patient is positive, the chance of transmission through this is very less. Yeah. And it costs a uh, very, very, I mean, few and cents. And plastic. Huh? Only a plastic sheet I think you can get everywhere there. And it is, it makes it difficult breathing for the patient? No, 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 no. The pay, most of the patients are in nasal prongs uh, on oxygen, so there is no problem. But even that, it's a very big sheet. It's not very tight. Very big. So, patient is breathing within that atmosphere. It's covered like a salad. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> and it, it, I think you should... Are you using any of these things there? Pantanen? A plus, plastic box. box. So, this is simply a plastic box. is one way to reuse. A uh, little more cumbersome. This is disposable. We use it for one patient throw it off. It's very cheap. So I'd recommend that you switch on to this plastic sheet. There's a distance between and the plastic box between the entry point and the yeah. patient's mouth yeah. and that area has to be covered and that causes a little challenge to the endoscopist. Yes. Yes. Yeah, so what about PEBR? It is now popular in a country because it is more convenient than PPE. Which so one? That Which one? PAP, PAPR. I don't know. We're not understanding. What, what, Can you repeat it again please? P P A P R P A P R machine. This is an oxygen generated machine. No, they are very costly and not practical. Yeah, it's very costly. Yeah, oxygenator. Oh, nasal flow oxygenator. No, 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 that's a <laughs> oxygenator. Oh, mask. Acha 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 acha. Yeah, yeah, P A P R. Yeah, yeah. So those are expensive, not practical, because they are quite bulky. And I think uh, there is no lot of evidence that using just a simple mask and protection to the patient will, uh, I think, uh, help you. Or uh, this more heavier gear makes it more difficult to do all these procedures. So we are there are one or two centers are in India using that, but I don't think it's very.
Bakuna are very necessary. There is no evidence to suggest it causes more protection. It is also important that your center, that doctors and the technicians and the staff in the room should also be tested in a frequent intervals. If anybody is asymptomatic and still positive, he should not transfer to others. So that may be yeah. another policy yeah. that we are following, which can be replicated at your place as well. So we are quite rigorous with testing all yeah. the staff. We have been doing very routinely. So I think if one staff member has any symptoms, I think all around him who are there should be tested. How easy is it to do RT-PCR there in your in your hospital, Kantana? Yes, RT-PCR is not easy. Uh, but uh, now we have uh, antibody tests available. It's only for healthcare worker screening. We yeah, but the problem with uh, IgM and IgG antibody levels are that they come in asymptomatic, they are not high, you can't detect them. And uh, if uh, they are symptomatic also, it's only after the first week. So, it's not a very quick. What I would strongly suggest is that you should recommend the government to get point of care because RT-PCR setup is expensive. They are doing RT-PCR machine and all may not be easy, but wow, you should strongly go into point of care tests. The point of care tests are like ELISA tests, the small strips. They are very cheap. So, you should uh, recommend uh, to your government and get point of care tests to be done for all the people there. So, it's not antibody tests? No, it's not antibody. Point of care test is swab test, same antigen. You take it like a swab, but instead of sending to the RT-PCR, now in your lab itself, we can dip it into your uh, slide and gives the answer in half an hour time. Very simple. It's a rapid antigen it's test. It's a rapid antigen test. So, you should go for this uh, point of care rapid antigen test. By the time yeah. anti antibodies are positive, the patient has, the, the person who is infected has already spread the virus. Yeah. Because by the time antibody develops, he has, he has cured himself. But he, <laughs> has, he is still spreading. So, we should aim at detecting antigen first. Uh, to protect the other people rather than to detect antibodies. So, either you can do point of care or PCR to detect antigen early in the course of disease. Antigen, we need to take a uh, nasal swab one. The one we need. It's not the blood test. The saliva thing, I think. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, we are also started doing saliva and we find that it's as effective as the nasal. So, especially for uh, symptomatic patient, the salivary positivity is similar to the nasal swab. And uh, sometimes the uh, saliva is positive, the nasal swab is negative also. So, in the negative patients, you can do saliva, but I think the problem for you is RT PCR is not established in many hospitals. The machine is not there, or the setup is not there in many hospitals in Myanmar. So, you will have to innovate. I think this rapid antigen test, we call the RAT, rapid antigen test, a point of care test is what you should, as a leader in Myanmar, you should insist on your government to get that. It's cheap and it can be done uh, quite easily anywhere in the side. Yeah, it's not available here. Only no, no, it's just a question of just getting it. Telling the government, it's available all over India now. It's uh, marketed in South Korea, India, China. Many countries are having this. It's not all costly. It's very cheap. It's costly it's less than half a dollar, I think. Uh, it's about uh, 500 rupees, which is like... Uh, Three-fourth of a dollar. So yeah, it's, uh, it's very less. It's about four or five dollars each. So, you can ask the... Uh, you can ask your government Sorry, to import this so that uh, it's cheaper and uh, it's more uh, uh, actually rational to do this rather than doing antibody test. Antibody test you stop doing. The only indication for antibody test is if you are doing a surveillance to show what population, how much population is infected and so on. For example, in our endoscope unit when we did the antibody test we found that some people symptomatic antigen positive, there are others who never had any symptoms but antibody was positive saying that they are already infected. So, this is uh, just for surveillance and for getting statistics but for practical use it is no use at all. Also for uh, selecting donors of plasma. Yeah, for the, you, you can actually test the IgG or spike protein specifically for plasma donors. But uh, otherwise I do not think we should be doing this rapid anti antibody test. We will discuss with uh, yeah. yeah. administrators. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Okay, thank so, you. Other thank questions you. are for Dr. Rakesh and Dr. Tim Rui. So, I think Dr. Rakesh is in the room. Or Rakesh is, uh, I think, uh, not okay. in the room now. I don't know whether you can receive it from his room there. So, I think I skip the question for Dr. Rakesh. Your, uh, people wants to know the complications of uh, its me uh, mechanical complications of uh, his devices because they are very much concerned about the uh, how to retrieve if uh, com uh, something complications happen for the devices. 
which device gardex device oh gardex uh -huh. no what i don't know gardex is given bariatric so the complications are actually among the devices the balloon is easiest to use it's like putting an ice tube inside and inflating it is no problem but the problem is when you remove the balloon you have to be very careful because sometimes it can get stuck at the airway so you have to be ready with uh, intubation and so on that's only problem with the balloon the problem uh, with uh, suturing devices is little the mastery of this technique is not so easy it takes some time to become good at suturing but once you become good is not a difficult procedure but there is there is a lot of operator variability is there how you do the procedure how much stomach you can actually take into this and so on sometimes bleeding can occur when you are doing the procedure but immediately if you put another suture the bleeding stops so this is not a problem at all perigastric abscesses small perigastric hematoma followed by abscesses have been reported similarly splenic injury has been reported with this uh, procedure but the incidence is extremely low so they are not uh, much uh, so these procedures bariatric both balloon and the suture techniques are quite safe Uh, the only problem in the suture technique is it takes a little time for mastery. The learning curve is quite high, so you have to learn it in animal lab first and then start doing it. So at least twenty or thirty cases before you get to be good at it. Thank you very much. So we'll move the uh, question to Dr. Jingo. Yes, some questions to answer. You want to ask me a question? local speaker no. so i think we'll move on to the other room thank you very much uh, tantane for this opportunity thank you very much sir thank, thank you, Any participant? Yeah. So yeah, we have some questions for Dr. Timuwe as well regarding H. pylori infection and and gastric cancer. So Professor Nani asks, how would the obstacle if we do mass screening for H. pylori? Dr. Timuwe, please. Yes. To do the mass screening in our country, we need to do. We need to consider for the screening test. Firstly, the screening test available here are serology test. Serology test has less specificity, le less specificity and sensitivity compared to the urea blood test and stool antigen test. Serology test is easier, uh, but we cannot get a uh, active infection of the patient. We can know only the uh, H. pylori carrier. And then the, for the urea blood test and stool antigen test, it has a high sensitivity and specificity, but it is expensive and relatively time-consuming. And ambition co cooperation is also needed for, to do these tests. Uh, after getting the H. pylori positive, positive cases, we need to do the eradication at the same time. Uh, uh, oh. <laughs> Screening without irradiation is also uh, meaningless. And so after irradiation, we also need to do the uh, endoscopic uh, surveillance program to detect the gastric lesions, uh, to, uh, to get the early gastric cancer diagnosis earlier. And to do the mass screening program here, we also have has a few number of the gastroenterologists. And then uh, we need to negotiate others to do the program. I think uh, the, uh, Dr. Nari will uh, happy to listen to this uh, question uh, answer. And the ne the next um, question is still for Dr. Timowe. What is the pathogenic association of salt intake and H. pylori infection? We only have an animal study for this uh, pathogenesis. And previously, H. pylori individuals, if, if they take uh, excessive salt intake, uh, they can get a high gastric pH and depletion of the gastroenteritis cells and the elevation of the interleukin 1 beta pathway and cause 
more severe inflammation that lead to the chronic arthritis and can have a more chance of the gastric adenocarcinoma compared to the lesser intake control. Thank, thank you. The, the, another question for Dr. Dimoui again. What should be the next plan if second line H pylori eradication fail? Uh, if second line H pylori eradication, we need to give the H pylori eradication again. Uh, on the result of the uh, antibiotic uh, sensitivity according to the culture and sensitivity results. Uh, we, we need to get that line eradication, that line eradication according to the culture and sensitivity results. So we have to, yes, we have to wait for the culture and sensitivity, no way uh, to put on another trial drops. I agree with the movie. So now we have all the uh, answer have been uh, all the uh, all the question has been answered. So it's time it's times comes to the conclusion. So I would like to thank uh, Team AID, uh, your uh, ever ready to help Nimar Gastro and draw this uh, to be up to date and. And also thanks to all the speakers and um, all the endoscopists, your lectures as well as your live demonstration with all a new technology. And then we also realized that now realize that how to restart uh, endoscopic procedure safely. And so last but not the least, I would like to thank Sun Pharma Company Limited uh, for your uh, continue education support without your uh, support this program would not be happen so hopefully when we have a vaccine uh, available successfully uh, we will remove uh, we will um, restart our procedure and uh, we start our hands-on uh, workshop together uh, with team EIG in the near future so thank you very much once again and also thanks to the audience uh, who give the time and, and give interactive uh, question and answer um, session. Thank you very much and be safe. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Santayin. Uh, Dr. Nagesh Reddy, Chairman of AAG Hospitals, Dr. Rakesh Kalapla, Consultant Gastroenterologist, of AAG Hospital, Professor Tantani, Head of the Department of Gastroenterology, Hingandan Sankaran Hospital of University of Medicine to Myanmar, Associate Professor Dr. Timove and Distinguished Guest. On behalf of Sun Pharma, I would like to extend my sincere gratitude to all of you for sharing your valuable experience today. Please join me in thanking Dr. Nadeshwar Reddy for the excellent presentations as well as the lucid elaboration of how to restore endoscopy safely with precautions due to this pandemic and way forward. Thanks, sir, for being us being the this. Dr. Rakesh Kalapala, sir, we are grateful to you in giving such an insight in the advances of bariatric and metabolic endoscopy. Associate Professor Dr. Timove Amma, thank you for taking us through in detection and eradication of H. pylori, which may be fatal if not treated. Professor Tantanye, Amma, we are extremely grateful to you in beautifully chairing today's sessions with pristine clarity. Big thank you to all the supporting faculty for sharing their own experiences with us. Uh, we look forward to your valuable academic advice in the coming years as well. We thank the technical team of AIG who has been the backbone in making such webinars successful and providing uninterrupted screening which is benefited by doctors worldwide and the thanks especially goes to Mr. Satinarayana and his team. I would also like to profusely thank on behalf of Sun Pharma all the doctors present here for gracing this occasion in spite of their very busy practices. It was indeed our privilege to have you all here. Also let me thank you for continuing your confidence in Sun Pharma and extending their benefits to your patients. Thanks a lot for great support all these years. Last but not the least, 
I would like to extend my sincere gratitude to all my fellow colleagues, the team of highly motivated and dedicated assets of Sun Pharma. Thank you all. Stay safe and stay healthy.